you very much, um, Umu, for the uh, introduction. Uh, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning, everybody, uh, in uh, wherever you are. Um, thank you, uh, UM, for inviting me. And um, without delaying, um, I would like to ask your permission to share my PowerPoint. The slides that I'll be using for today's session. Are you able to see the slide? Yes, bro. Okay. Yes, bro. Um, thank you very much. All right. Um, so as mentioned by Umu just now, um, the topic of the, the workshop um, is developing appropriate assessment for a course. And I think this is one, one um, aspect that I think many uh, instructors would love to know because we have to do assessment and we sometimes often wonder whether whatever that we're doing is actually um, helping our students to achieve the learning outcome that it has been stipulated in our course. So I'm hoping, <laughs> because that this is the challenge of doing training via online, and I'm hoping that um, by the end of this session, you will be able to um, understand the various um, elements that should be considered when developing um, assessment and, and hopefully from there uh, be able to see what kind of appropriate assessment that could be relevant for your own course. So to help me to do that, there will be three main objectives. Lah. So the first objective will be to discuss the notion of learning and assessment in outcomes-based education for higher education. Because I think until and unless we understand that, we will not be able to, to really plan um, a good um, assessment. The second objective is to identify, you'll have a go at identifying various appropriate assessment and then um, and the final objective is actually uh, for you to be able to share assessment from various courses. We'll, we'll see, inshallah. And, and finally, we will end it with a wrap up. So um, as usual, are you able to see this Mantimeter on the screen? Yeah. Oh, I've got to switch on the chat now so that I can see. Yes, okay. Yes, bro. So if you're able to do that, can you please um, uh, scan it or um, go to www.menti.com and the code is 65099104 um, and, and have a go at doing that, please. There are 31 participants, so I'm hoping that 31 participants have um, or maybe removing Umu and, and and the um, technical team, and there will be about about twenty nine people able to answer. There are only fourteen people um, answering it. Can 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 you everybody speed up the process of answering it, please? All right. Uh, based on the 23 people um, who have actually um, responded to this, on a scale of five, um, uh, you are to rate yourselves and to strongly disagree, to strongly agree. Um, and looking at this, based on the 24 people who have now um, responded, uh, it seems that there are some... Uh, components that they're, you're fine with it, but there are some components that I think we need to really uh, look into. So number one, and I understand what constructive alignment is, although it's 3.5, but I, I with a scale of five, I assume this is something that we need to rework. And there, there are some of you who are still not sure about constructive alignment. And, and we will tackle this because this is very important. Uh, until and unless we understand what constructive alignment is, we will never be able to uh, figure out what kind of appropriate assessment would be suitable for our course and for our course learning outcome. But um, the good part, uh, the good side of it is that all of you um, know that outcomes-based education is important, or all of you believe that out outcomes-based education is important. So that's that's a good, that's a very good sign. Um, so that's four point seven. Alhamdulillah. So the next is I'm creative enough to cr create meaningful activities based on the learning outcomes. Well, I think being Malaysian, we tend to, you know. Uh, don't want to say that we're good at doing things. So I'm assuming that 
uh, you're a little bit shy and being humble. So, uh, but if if not, um, then this is also um, hope, hope, hopefully uh, another way of igniting your creativity um, files in your in your mind, um, so that you are able to get ideas from different people. Uh, hope, hope, hopefully, people from uh, the ones who are joining this this workshop today. Um, and hopefully learning from each other, yeah? Um, and of course, to become creative, it comes with experience. It, 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 it comes with people who constantly want to think, and it comes with reading. So the more you read, the more you um, also learn from other people, you know, especially now with all the social medias that we have, um, the better we are at, um, you know, thinking out of the box, uh, if I may say so. Right. The next one is I'm able to ensure that my students achieve the learning outcomes. Uh, that's also 3.5. You, you're not sure that you're actually able to help your students um, achieve it or not. Um, we will look into that about how, the strategies and ways that we can actually help our students. Um, and finally, I know how to create assessment that measures the learning outcome. Even that one is also another problem which is actually 3.3, the lowest of them all. Um, uh, meaning um, there are some, some, some areas that we need to focus on uh, in this session. So thank you for, for responding. Right, um, let's get back to... Now, this is where I'm not sure. Are you able to see the slides moving or it's still at the Mentimeter? Moving, moving. Moving, okay, good. So it's le le we're now um, uh, unpacking those issues that you're still not sure of, which is actually uh, related to creating uh, um, activities, understanding what is constructive alignment, and at the same time, how to assess students. So that's, that's the reason why this particular section is there, which is uh, entitled Learning and Assessment in the Context of OBE in Higher Education. Um, and before um, I begin, um, I think there are many documents that uh, BKA, Bahagian Kesemalangan Akademik, JPT, Jabatan Pengajian Tinggi, or J Jabatan Pendidikan Tinggi, have actually come up with a lot of um, publication last year. Um, I think last year was the year of um, all this um, uh, being launched. And we just had our uh, book on uh, also, which I was also involved and headed uh, the project, which is called Ebook Alternative Assessment in Higher Education. Uh, actually, the title is a different thing, but basically it's about alternative assessment. And we just had our three three series of webinars uh, explaining the book. And I think uh, in order for you to know more about what, what are the ways that you can actually do? Um, there are many books that you can actually look and 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 refer, but the two most important uh, uh, book, uh, I think, which is related to you when you're talking about assessment, are these two books. One is the Alternative Assessment in Higher Education, and the other one is the Noble. Um, what is Noble? Noble, um, if you can, for those of you who remember ICGPA. So we had the, the learning clusters and all the rubric being shared in, in, in the document. So Noble is actually the, the, the upgraded version because of the MQF 2.0 change. So if you want to know about the learning clusters that we have in, in our MQF 2.0, uh, Noble is, a, is also one, uh, one uh, good um, resources that you can actually refer to. And of course, you've got the MQA guideline. Um, for assessment, a student assessment, which is still under, um, currently uh, going through, uh, um, how should I say, mm, ad uh, addition, yeah, uh, being, being edited by uh, a group members. Again, that's also another project that I'm uh, currently leading. So um, for those who are not clear about what outcomes-based education is, um, I think everybody understands, right? It's important because it helps uh, people to um, understand the curriculum, understand the assessment, and understand the reporting, uh, reporting of what 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 
the processes of, of um, delivery and assessment. Uh, and all that is done for the sake of ensuring that there's quality. So in terms of the curriculum, uh, you develop the curriculum in order to ensure that the design of the course learning outcomes are aligned with the program learning outcome in meeting the local and global demands that places learners and learning as central. And because it is outcome is based at education, the focus of our attention is not us. The, the focus of our attention is not the topics. The focus of our attention is not just the curriculum. Actually, the focus of our attention is actually the students. We need to make sure that our students are able to achieve the outcomes that we have um, um, identified to be relevant for the course, relevant for the program, in view of trying to address the demands um, of workforce um, uh, when they, uh, you know, when when they leave the, the the university. In terms of assessment, ensuring that assessment is aligned to the intended learning outcomes of the courses, and this is part of what we call constructive alignment. I'll, I'll be talking about constructive alignment later on, but just to give you an overview. So, whatever that we do, uh, it will be falling back on the learning outcomes that we have already identified uh, in the courses. And um, that's where students experience construction of knowledge through meaning making. And, and, and that's why it's called constructive alignment. Students are const constructively um, trying to make sense about what the, the, the course and the program that they are uh, uh, involved in. And when we have completed the, the whole uh, you know, delivery and assessment, that's not the end of the story. Uh, the next is actually to report assurance of learning. Assurance of learning means how sure are we that our students have actually achieved the stipulated outcomes. And this requires reflective in practice. That means you reflecting your own practices when, when you are delivering and when you were assessing your students based on the student's performance. So when we're talking about um, the context of higher education, I think any education context for that matter, but for specifically for higher education, we have the learners, we have the learning, we have the teaching, we have the assessment. So all of these are, um, all of these components are actually very inter interrelated. So in terms of the learners, as I mentioned just now, because it's outcome-based education, and if you look at your syllabus, it says at the end of the day, students will be able to, so the learners are the central focus. And uh, and what we have to do, the process that we are going to be doing is actually to ensure that learners learn. So the process has got to be done well. And in terms of teaching, in order to, to ensure that, we have to make sure that we are able to design the right um, um, learning activities. Yeah. So that the, 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 and taking into consideration that the learners that we have in our classroom um, uh, in ensuring that uh, learning can take place. And finally, assessment, ensuring learning is achieved after having given feedback. Meaning, in the 14 weeks that we have, it depends, yeah, if those some, some of you who have, uh, who probably have tri semester and they might have 12 weeks of face to face and another two weeks of online or something of that sort. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter whether, uh, uh, so if you're talking about a three credit paper, you will have about 14 weeks uh, for you to. Um, uh, to deliver so that within that 14, week, 14 weeks, students must have been given some form of feedback in, before they actually do their summative assessment, before they actually do uh, an assessment that will be carry, I mean, will carry weight in their overall performance. Because um, the reason why we have to make sure that our assessment is actually aligned to the learning outcome and the learning outcome uh, and the learning processes and the teaching processes is also aligned to the learning outcome is because both of it are actually interrelated. The learning, learning and assessment is actually two sides of the same point. That's why I'd like to caveat here. My, my area of expertise is not assessment, it's actually learning. But when you're talking about learning, you cannot run away from assessment uh, because that's how. Uh, we we know that learning has taken place when we are able to get um, some um, indicator and those indicator comes from students' performance when they are given um, assessment. And our ultimate aim as, as instructors um, or educators for that matter 
is actually um, to ensure that our students have um, uh, the ability, well, we try as best as we can to um, ensure that our students can become intellectual beings. So that means that's why we have the cognitive. We have to ignite their cognitive level. We have got to ignite their effective level, not only in terms of the cognition, not only in terms of their thinking as an intellectual being, but we also need to make sure that they, they have, or we can um, facilitate their uh, value development. So it, to instill values in enriching their soul before they, are, they can actually become um, contributing citizens. So all this, when you talk about cognitive, effective, sakomoto, I'm sure all of you will tell me that you can actually find this in your syllabus. Am I right? Uh, maybe thumbs up the, is there no emoticon here? Yep. So you find all this um, cognitive, effective, and psychomoto uh, in your um, syllabus, right? In your course learning outcome. And that's what, that's why the course learning outcome, uh, the course learning outcomes matters because that's where understanding them will help you to do all this will help you to create intellectual being, instill values to enrich their souls and to help them to, to um, you know, to develop um, contributing citizens. Um, yeah, I just, write, I, I just wrote Ilmu Budi Bhakti here because uh, the motto of our University Utara Malaysia is actually Ilmu Budi Bhakti and I, I feel very privileged to be in this university because I'm constantly reminded that um, we have to make sure that our students not only gain knowledge, but they have the right attitude in order, and the right skills in order to become contributing citizens. So when we talk about designing our activities, the first thing, of course, um, 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 is actually to understand our learners. But yeah, oops, what happened? Yeah. Um, so the first thing that we need to look is actually the course learning outcome. So what is the course learning outcome? And then we look at the skills that, that is connected to the course learning outcome. So when, we talk, when you talk about the skills, uh, this, I forgot to change the, um, the, 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 the skills that we're talking about here is the learning cluster and then the topics and then the students. So the learning cluster will be based on the MQF 2.0. And then we look at the topics and involved and at the same time looking at the students. So what is construct and when all this is actually related to the constructive alignment, alama yeah. So I was, as I was saying, we start with the course learning outcome and then look at the the skills that's connected to the course learning outcome. Then only you look at the topics and of course when when you are preparing the activities, you have to consider consider the students. I mean the stu the types of students that you have in the classroom. Then only you are able to um, develop the right um, activities. And when you're talking about constructive alignment, and remember the first the first um, item that we had, and and everybody scored I think about three point four. Um, basically, what learning uh, what constructive alignment is is like an align when you, when you talk about the the metaphor of um, um, going you know aligning your car, which is usually what what we have in our mind when we talk about alignment. Um, basically, we have got four tires. So the first tire that is very very important will be the learning outcome and and when we when when, when i say learning outcome here not only it, it involves the cognitive the effective the sakomoto but it also involves the learning clusters so understanding that that will be the the main yeah and the rest of the the, the other three tires need to be aligned to that so the next one will be the delivery when you talk about delivery is actually related to the teaching as well as the learning learning um uh, activities. So what the what how we as educators um, uh, plan design our activities, and those activities must help our students to learn. And when I say um, helping our students to learn, basically they are activating the learning outcome that we have actually indicated in our syllabus. For example, if the learning outcome is apply. It is not you who's applying. It is not you who tell them how to apply. It is the students um, having a goal via various activities applying. 
applying based on the topics that you have um, in the uh, course, design for your course. So in terms of the delivery, it includes activities that are designed not only for formative assessment. So format, in case you're not sure about what's formative assessment, what's summative assessment. Formative assessment is where you provide feedback to your students, whereas summative assessment is where you only uh, uh, give them the score. Well, formative assessment, you can give them the score, but the score does not, does not become part of the total overall performance of the students. Whereas summative assessment, it will be uh, included in the in the total overall performance of the students. So that, that's why what it means by it's always usually at the end. At the end means there's no more feedback. You are using uh, the information um, um, to uh, as a form of uh, indicating how 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 well the students have actually learned um, the particular course. In this case, uh, achieving the learning outcome. So uh, in terms of delivery, you have to include activities designed for formative assessment in order to provide feedback to students for improvement. So you are using that 14 weeks, as I mentioned just now, before you provide the summative assessment, you are providing them opportunities through the activities in your classroom in order for you to be able to provide feedback. And these activities, you're actually, when you're doing these activities, you're assessing them. But this is what we call formative assessment. And the feedback does not no, not necessarily come from you. The feedback can also come from their peers, or you can actually get the industry people to come in to give feedback. And, and all this, or the community, if you're doing service learning, uh, you, you, they can even get the feedback from the community. So those feedback will help the students to see what is it that they need to do in order to improve and in order to achieve um, um, you know, the learning outcome. Finally, um, the assessment. So the third, the, the, the other two tire will be the learning and the teaching and the final, final tire to align to the main tire, which is learning outcome, will be the assessment. So it's designed with the ultimate aim to gather students' understanding of the course content with reference to the learning outcome. Yes, uh, the course content is also relevant, but the course content is actually the context. What is more important is the learning outcome because the learning outcome is where the standard is. That's the standard of the cognitive level, the standard of the effective level, st standard of the psychomotor level, standard of the learning cluster that you have um, identified will be suitable for the particular course. So far, so good. Any questions thus far? I mean, I'm open to um, questions if you do have any. So silence means everything is fine. So I'll continue. So to, to put that in perspective of in, in outcomes based um, education. So as a teacher, we are very, what we do is, that's why I'm saying we have to focus on the intended outcome. Because as students, when they come into the classroom, usually what do they do? They will ask you questions like, uh, Madam or Sir, what will be, is this going to come out in the exam or how are we going to be assessed? So those are the kind of questions that usually students will ask. When, you know, what kind of assignment are we going to be able uh, to do in this particular course, this particular semester? So they will be very concerned about assessment, but although we are supposed to be concerned about our intended outcomes. So that's fine because... If you understand constructive alignment, uh, you design your, your delivery and your, your, your teaching and learning um, delivery uh, um, to align to the learning outcome and your assessment also align to the learning outcome, the students will achieve the learning outcome. You know, that's, it's, 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 it's logical that way. And of course, now because of the pandemic, I think all of us have, have, uh, got used to the, the idea of using even digital way. And we are now also being exposed to high flex learning and, and God knows whatever learning. So whatever it is, um, in whatever context and modalities that you are, you are using, um, the basic and the, the crux of the matter is you have to understand what is the learning outcome? How are you going to align your delivery? How are you going to design your activities your, in order for your students to be able to do it? which is aligned to the learning outcome. And finally, how are you big, what kind of assessment would be suitable for your students in view of the learning outcome and the context in which your course has. So, 
what will be important will be number one to understand your learners. Um, so you have to take the trouble to understand your learners because um, what we want or how we want um, learning to take place is where students become engaged. All right, in 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 learning. So when I say engaged here, means they are so um, focused, so interested to 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 do the assessment that they are willing to go extra mile, you know, to to really um, uh, really grasp uh, and 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 have mastery uh, in 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 the in the course that they are taking. So to do that, we need to take we have to take the trouble to understand our students, where they're coming from, what what are their interests uh, for that matter. And some people actually go to the extra mile of understanding students' learning styles. Uh, whether they are kinesthetic or audio or visual, and that's how they design uh, um, their delivery um, when uh, when um, explaining to the to the students. And of course, the prerequisites prerequisite knowledge is also pertinent. And I think um, we too have to make sure that we understand um, the academic structure of our program. That there will be courses that are deemed as um, introduction before um, other courses follow suit. So we, uh, uh, you know, not allowing our students to take um, at any time uh, whatever courses that they think they, they, they can, uh, they, they, they feel that they can, they can take without understanding the, the structure because at the end of the day, students will not understand um, um, because they came in at the wrong time, you know what I mean. Um, that's supposed to be a lo a, a lower, simpler uh, course, but taken in semester five. The course in semester five is taken in semester one, so that's that's just so not 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 advisable. So the next is actually the learning outcomes, uh, understanding uh, the expectation, and this expectation, as I mentioned just now, is actually in your syllabus. It's in your CLO, which is the course learning outcome. So you have to understand this um, and you have to communicate this and, and your expectation to your students as well. Uh, and it's not just the topics, it's the course learning outcomes first and then you, you explain the, the topics, as I mentioned, is actually the context. And whatever that you choose when delivering, you need to ensure that it's the learners who are excited to activate the verbs, not, not you. So if it's, as I gave you an example just now, if it's apply, it's your students who's actually doing the apply. So what do you do? You create situations in which they have to apply. And the situation can be as creative as possible, as real world, closer to the real world as possible in order for them to become, um, in order to, to for them to be, to have some idea about what they will be, you how they will be using the knowledge that they have in your, in, in, uh, after taking your particular course. And this one requires conscious effort when designing. And finally, the assessment, ensuring that learning is measured accordingly, basically answering how well have they activated the verbs? How well have they applied? How well have they identified? How well have they discussed? How well have they explained? And whatever, depending on whatever verbs that you have chosen in your course learning outcome. Right. Um, I should have, wait now. Yeah. Right, can you just click on that link and answer those questions, please? I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to do that. Oh, while you're doing that, I'm going to answer um, Usha's question. Prerequisites or hierarchy? Well, what, what I meant was when you do your academic uh, program structure, it's designed in such a manner that it's hierarchical, hierarchical in nature, right? From simple to difficult. So we don't want... So uh, the, simple, the simpler courses will be the prerequisites for, for the, the rest of the courses that follow suit, right? 
So we don't want our students to take whatever courses that they want at any time. Um, if it has been designed in such a manner that it's hierarchical in nature. If it's not designed in, in a hierarchical nature, it's it's fine. So they can they can choose which, whatever that, that pleases them. But if you have designed in such a manner that one course is a prerequisite to the next course, then they have to make sure that they follow through. They they do the, the prereqs before the, the other courses. That's that's what I mean. Okay, Usha. Right, there are 42 of you in this room. Yeah, uh, Farinda's question is, what do you mean by table of specification? Uh, I don't know what you call it. Uh, is Jadwal Specifikasi Ujian? Table of specification is that. Um, it's where you ask questions based on the CLO and the, and the, and the taxonomy. Yeah, correct. Sure. Ah, uh, boleh boleh. <laughs> Tapi kalau nak jawab, tak apa. <laughs> tak ada nak. I'm just joking. Tak ya tak ya tak ya. Tak ya puan Asia. It's okay. So tunggu sekejap ya. Lagi lima minit. Correct, correct, Yusufisha. The, the table of specification refer to the question to the level in the taxonomy based on your course, correct. Okay, while we wait for the rest to, um, to fill up the form, I think um, I'll just go through very slowly um, for the next section. So when you talk about assessment, Mm, I think those questions were more uh, related to assessment, right? So you talk about assessment. Um, I think before we go any further, I think there are there are some terms that that um, usually use um, interchangeably, and I think uh, it's best that we uh, get that one sorted so that we know what those different terminologies are, uh, and we know when we use those particular words what what we are what, what we are talking about, yeah. So the first one is testing. I think everybody knows what testing is, right? Um, a test is where you want to gather a sample of behavior um, uh, based on the performance for a particular domain. So basically, when you usually the, the kind of test that we will have um, in the higher education will be the final exam questions, lah, um, where we will develop those questions uh, in order to get gather. Um, well, a sample of behavior in the sense of how did they perform, how do they understand, um, how, um, you know, um, what the course content is all about. And sometimes uh, this test can also come in the form of um, something that is intangible. For example, your belief system or your feeling. And, and I think those who are familiar with I mean, doing such research in social sciences would know that survey is kind of like a test where you you actually um, can measure someone's um, feeling or belief system uh, you know uh, uh, through through this this constructs that you have actually um, uh, designed um, to measure whatever um, that you are uh, researching about so that's testing Assessment is human activity that are descriptive in nature involves interaction. I think that is very, very crucial. Uh, when you talk about interaction here, it means providing feedback. Um, it's giving them uh, guidance about what is it they need to... It's not about telling them the, the answer. That's not, that's not uh, um, what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is um, how can we guide our students to to think or to do better. So we can actually say, um, I like the way you 
um, explain about this, perhaps you would want to consider. So the perhaps you want to consider is actually your guide, your guide to your students on how to improve, how to make that improvement. Um, to seek what learners have achieved informally and formally. And that this is where um, what we mean by formally will be the, the, the summative assessment. But when you say informally will be the formative assessment where we can actually provide those feedback in our classroom during our uh, teaching time, you know, our delivery uh, when we're doing the formative assessment. Measurement is a process of assigning numbers to attributes or characteristics of persons, objects or events according to explicit formulation or rules. So, for example, you're providing a score. So, the score is given to the, the, the um, whatever last. So, if it's a test, you, if it's a 40 question test and each question carries two marks, so you know the overall score will be 80. Uh, so, some, and I'm sure if you have, um, uh, you, if you were also present during our web, webinar, the three series webinar on alternative assessment, mm -hmm. um, we also encourage people to also consider alternative assessment where you are able to really uh, assess students' skills that cannot be assessed during a final exam situation. So, you know, skills like ethics. So this, these are all intangible. You can't, you can't really see, but you can actually measure by the, the same way in which you do the survey, but this time you develop rubric. So when you develop the rubric, you've got the quality and the criteria, uh, and you can actually assign scores to the criteria uh, in order for you to, um, um, to provide the score. So at the end, the score will, will um, uh, provide um, um, tangible evidence for you to know how well did they uh, achieve those um, specific criteria that is actually measuring the construct of either cognitive, affective, psychomotor, or it, uh, whatever skills that you have written. And with that measurement, then only you can do the next, the next stage, which is actually the evaluation. Evaluation is where you provide judgment. So once you've already got the score, the next thing is you want to find out whether, so based on the score, is this an A? Is this a B? Is this a C? Or, uh, and so on and so forth. So that is evaluation, a process wherein the parts and processes or outcomes of a program are examined, satisfac satisfactory or not, based on objectives or standards. And this is where you provide judgment. Yeah, okay. Usha has got a question. Ethics, how to assess or measure? Answering questions to give expected answer is not an actual evidence of what will be done. Okay. That's what, that's what I'm saying. I mean, if you ask questions, even if you ask questions, you will not be able to get what they, they do, right? But when you ask them to actually do projects, for example, and it's, it's through the projects that they do, they, they have to, you know, actually do certain activities. And upon their reflection on what they did in the activities, you can actually measure, you can actually measure their, you can actually have a kind of indicator of what what kind of ethics level you, that's where you have to look at the no, noble to see what kind of criteria that, that's suitable for ethics and professionalism so that's where you will have an indicator about what they have done through the project and um, how you use the rubric in order to 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 help measure to the best you know the best that you can it, does, does that answer your um yeah does that answer your question usha okay no sorry sorry uh <clears throat> i i think it's quite difficult because even sometimes when you give project work to students you know you might see one person doing the work but they put two people's name on it and even ah. if you give a breakdown of you know, what should be done and how much they just manipulate. <clears throat> I mean, manipulation is very, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. So that's a different story altogether. That is um, where um, not only we talk about ethics, but we also about, talk about the teamwork and collaboration, you know, who is actually doing what, um, how do they actually um, uh, contribute in the, in the group or is it, are we talking, I mean, um, are they riders or are they really contributing uh, members uh, in, in the group? So that's a, that's a different story altogether. And I think 
um, to tackle that, that will be a different issue. So that's why, um, for example, when I give, um, I used to teach um, undergraduate and I had about 120 students or more than that uh, in my class. And what I do is, um, well, it was so, I'm, I'm lucky, well, I wouldn't say lucky, but well, I'm lucky in the sense that in that particular course that I'm teaching, there are 10 theories that will be uh, introduced to the students. So I, I was able to get 10 people to be in the group and every member is responsible to do one theory. And if that member don't do well, it will affect the whole entire, uh, the performance of the whole entire group. And, um, and by doing that in the classroom, when you're providing feedback and telling them uh, why is it, and, and they also observing how other groups are doing better, that is also a lesson to that, to, you know, a lesson learned um, for the groups that did not do well and for the group member who did not contribute well. And that's, that's how um, the process of um, educating them to take accountability in their own learning um, begin by allowing them to make those mistakes, but then providing guidance about what they, they could have done uh, or how they could, or in a sense that they could have done better if all of them actually, uh, you know, uh, did a good job on it. And actually, sometimes you don't even have to say, you know, uh, all they need to do is just to look at, to look at what other people are doing. I remember teaching um, for the life of me now, I can't remember what the program was, but basically it is, um, uh, there were a, a primary school teachers who were supposed to be given warrants uh, for them to be upgraded into um, um, graduate teachers. Um, so, so actually, I would say three quarter of them will not like the idea. They are basically quite elderly and they do not want, they just want to be upgraded in terms of the salary, but they don't want to be upgraded in terms of the cognitive or the affective or the psychomotor and whatever skills that you have. And it was really, it was really difficult to teach those, those group because um, of the kind of you know the kind of behavior that they come with, it, with them in the classroom and i had to i had to change their mindset in the sense that i and, and worse still i was younger not not now i was very much younger then and you know you can imagine them sitting like that looking at you um teaching because they feel that they are much elderly and they they know more about uh, about things compared to you and i always tell them well you, you see the pintu gerbang in uum before entering Put all your put all your pengetua shape and your guru penolong kanan or whatever in the bushes before you enter because as you enter, I am your instructor and you are all my students. And in my class, they they had to do a lot of uh, activities and one of the activities that I asked them to do was actually to do the mind map. I just asked them to to um, show the theory to explain the theory in the mind map. And there was one group of um, Actually, they, they were all hate teachers. Uh, one of the hate teachers, who's actually the typo of the group, came to me and said, uh, Doctor, can we like do it next time? Can we submit it and, and show it next time? And I said, why? Uh, because we didn't do a good job. Now, did I tell them that they didn't do a good job? I didn't. Because what I asked them to do uh, on that day was, now that you have already done your, your mind map, now paste it on the wall. And I divided the, the whole entire hall into four quadrants and they have to pin uh, the, the, their mind map on the wall and they have to explain to each other, taking turns. It's just like in a, in a poster presentation that you see in the conferences. So they have got to explain to everybody about what they have, why they designed it that way and what did they put in, in the mind map. And they were, this group of uh, head teachers who came to me, they were shy or because other people's mind map was so much better than theirs. Theirs was just topics, you know, top, uh, one, uh, the, the topic of the course and all the topic of the, the theory. Um, so that's why if you put them in a situation where they're actually learning from each other, you don't even have to give them the feedback. They will know that they have actually not done a good job 
And my concern is not about that. My concern is about how much have they learned from others and how much have they learned from their mistakes. And I think that was a turning point for them too, because before they were always condescending, you know, having this constant condescending kind of attitude. But after that, they began to have a more open-minded um, attitude towards learning. I think that's very crucial. Okay, um, function of assessment. There are various types of assessment uh, function, I think. Assessment of learning, assessment for learning, and as learning. I think all of us are very familiar with assessment of learning, but not, not so much for for and as. But for and as is actually part of the formative assessment. So, for example, that, that this is part of the book, yeah, the, the one that I'm saying, um, the Alternative Assessment in Higher Education Practical Guide to Assessing Learning under GPT. Uh, um, this is what I took from the one of the pages in the book. Uh, for assessment for learning, it's feedback being embedded during teaching and learning. And this is where um, the example that I gave you about the mind map, I'm ask, I asked them to actually share. That's an activity in the classroom. So it's supposed to be me giving lecture about the 10 theories. But giving lecture to people who do not like to learn and have left education for a long time will just help them to fall asleep in my class. So having them to do the activities, having them to start thinking about how to do the mind map, having to, before they can do the mind map, they've got to read. Um, having them to explain, and some of them don't know how to explain because they were not actually um, doing it well, but they actually recorded other people who, who could explain well, and they were actually learning on the spot. Um, and at the end of the class, the debriefing session was just me asking, okay, who can tell me about Piaget's theory? And everybody raising their hands. Uh, it was a lively classroom. Um, they were all uh, keen to tell me what they, what they have understood, uh, not only from um, listening to other people um, uh, and also from their own reading. And the group of um, the head teachers who didn't do their, their, their assignment well, they because at the end after after the whole session, I say, okay, um, what have you learned from this particular activity? And one of them actually said, for the first time in my entire life, uh, learning in this university, this is the first time I didn't even have time to sit, and it was a three-hour uh, um, class. Yeah. Right, assessment as learning, ongoing self-assessment by learning to uh, by learners themselves to monitor their own learning. So you, we can actually do this with technology, you know. Um, for example, if you come up with a lot of uh, with, uh, with task questions, you put it in the in your uh, your respective LMS, yeah, learning management system, your online uh, LMS. Um, and if you if you design in such a manner that uh, when uh, the questions let's just say the students got it wrong, there will be explanation why they got it wrong. You know, for if they, they, they put the option A and that's not the right answer, they will, uh, there will be explanation about why that's wrong. So if you, if you design in such a manner those kind of quizzes that help students to understand the fundamentals, um, students learn uh, in that process too. That's where they, they will assess themselves um, how much they have improved from the first time they did the assessment, the test, the second time, the third time, and all that. I mean, that's not your summative test, but that's a test for them to, to have a go at understanding the basic concepts before they are given the, the summative assessment, which is actually the final, final exam. Okay. So some general principles when you're designing your assessment is that, um, of course, you have to make sure that it is not biased. Right, um, it's free from bias. It it measures what it's supposed to be measuring. So, uh, and when we're talking about measuring what's supposed to be measuring, we are talking about the learning outcome and the learning cluster. And of course, the tool of measurement is appropriate. If it's appropriate for you to just uh, use checklists, use a checklist. If it's appropriate for you to do the exam questions, like in the final exam, make sure the answer key tallies well with the question, and make sure the question is actually valid. Whatever it is, whether you're using uh, rubric or you, your items that you have in your final exam questions, you must make sure that they are valid and they are reliable. And of course, clarity in the marking scheme. And if there are many of you actually marking, there must be <clears throat> um, uh, moderation uh, being done so that there will be no issues on inter reliability. Feasible, it's got to be 
in a time, a location, an environment that is conducive for students to actually do their assignment. And finally, fairness. Um, so it includes everything, yeah, the, the kind of questions that you have um, and, and, and the content covered. Which, what, what, this is why, why it's important for you to know what is the weightage. Weightage here means uh, when you're doing your table of specification or your jadual specifikasi ujian, um, I don't know what it's called. I mean, there's so many terminologies, but usually table of specification is what it is, where you put the questions according to the course learning outcome and the level of the taxonomy and all that. It has got to be... Um, um, also relevant, the weightage yeah, has got to be relevant to the number of hours that you have spent on the course learning outcome and on the topic. So you cannot ask many questions on a course learning outcome that is just being introduced for six hours compared to another course learning outcome that is being introduced for more than 12 hours. So the kind, the number of items that you will a, a, a number of items that you can pick from the topic must gel with the number of hours that you have spent by the course learning outcome. We, so the course learning outcome and the topic, you, you would have actually uh, connected it together. So you will know which topic is actually for which course learning outcome. And from there, you will be able to know how much time that you have spent um, teaching it in order for you to know how many questions that you, you can actually ask for your final exam questions. And the weightage it can be also used for your course coursework assignment, which means if you know that there's you spend twenty percent of your total hundred percent time uh, um, delivering, so you kind of know uh, you've got again twenty percent off. Well, if it's a sixty percent sixty marks, so twenty percent of sixty marks, that will be the the percentage that 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 you should be doing for that particular assignment. So the purpose of doing exam uh, is not to fail our students. So we have to make sure that um, we are trying to, as, our, as best as possible, to create future talents. And future talents do not need regurgitation of information because they can always do that by clicking the Google. What we want is for them to be able to know what they can do with the knowledge. So um, they, you have to consider that. Yeah. Psychological, are they anxious? Are they very stressful? I remember when my child was actually in the United Kingdom and he has to sit, sit for his set, uh, the standard standardized assessment test. Uh, because he that was the first ever exam that he had to sit, the, the teacher was very concerned that you know he that his his anxiety would actually influence his performance that they actually removed him from the exam hall and put him outside and gave him a glass of water I mean that is the kind of I mean that's too ideal for us to do but um, those are the kind of consideration I mean if your, your, your student is not well you we need to find out uh, they need to tell us so that we can take that into consideration or we can we can allow them to have a more conducive environment so, because what we want is actually for them to actually tell us um, what you know what what they, they understood from, from, from whatever the, that we are teaching. Um, contextual constraints of meeting, whether, you know, whether it's difficult for them to have, if it's online, whether it's difficult for them to, to have an online, um, uh, to do it online assessment. Um, if, if they, you yeah, know, all those things, are, the, the contextual, there's, there are many constraints that we will have depending on the kind of context that we, that we are in. And of course, we live in this VUCA world. And because of that, there are many alternative ways for us to assess learning. And it's not just the final exam. So um, to reiterate, we have to, if you're considering alternative assessment, um, apart from other assessment that you, the, 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 not, the conventional way of, of assessing, uh, whatever it is, you, it's got to be fair, fair, fairness, reliable, valid, as close as possible to the real world. Um, it, it allows for creative solutions. So if you're doing a project, it allows for creative solution, allows for collaborative learning. So the fact that you're asking them to do it in groups is great, but that you must also ensure that every member is actually uh, accountable to do, to do work rather than um, you know, just asking them to do um, blindly. Right. Um, 
And if you're using alternative assessment, chances are you'll be using rubric. So you've got to make sure that the rubric and the criteria match as well with the learning outcome and of course the tasks and um, providing feedback, meaning you at least once, if not more, uh, to provide the formative assessment to your students before you actually provide them with the summative assessment. So the basic um, um, elements of constructive alignment, learning outcome, what other learning outcomes involves, what are the topics that are related to the learning outcome, how many hours are spent on the learning outcomes per week, as I mentioned just now, how many weeks are needed to be, to be used in order to re redesign if there is crisis. Um, so meaning... It doesn't matter if you have any crisis in the future, not just the COVID-19, whatever crisis that you have in the future, all you need to do is just to look at your learning outcome. You need to, do, to look at the number of hours that you have spent for that learning outcome. What are the topics that are um, uh, connected to those learning outcome? Because the topics become the context. And from there, you are able to design the right assessment uh, you know, for the right context. Um, uh, whether it's crisis or, or, or not. So um, looking at the topics, as I mentioned just now, the topics is actually the context. So if your topics is related to, um, uh, for example, if you're teaching educational psychology, if your topic is on, on um, adolescent, so your context will be related to issues about adolescent. So you are going to, create those kind of activities for them to, to do. And if the verb is actually to explain, so you will create um, tasks that requires them to explain, explain about what, explain about the adolescent development. Third is that on the learning uh, activities, um, in order for you to make sure that you are also providing opportunities for the students to receive feedback from you through the formative assessment and finally the summative assessment. And this summative assessment, I think all of us, even in you know, University of Malaya, uh, um, have already changed. Um, if before it was all 100% at the end of the, of the semester, now it is spread throughout the semester because we are now following continuous assessment where we continuously assess our students summatively throughout the semester. And to do, to, to, uh, now that we know, we have to look at the course learning outcome. The next is actually to know the levels that we have in the course learning outcome. This is crucial. And I think I'm not going to dwell on this because I think everybody have understood all this, um, the different levels. And understanding these different levels is crucial because that's how you are going to, that, that's going to give you the indicator. That's, that's going to give you the, the clue about what kind of design that you would need, what kind of level that you would need when you're designing. And the, the next is actually the uh, domain, the psychomotor domain, and as well as the effective domain. And not to forget the MQF 2.0. All right. Um, which has 11 domains and five clusters. So all this LOC, 3A, 3B, 3C, I'm sure all of us have actually changed our syllabus to follow the MQF 2.0. Once it's there, it's not just there in the document, it's there for us to evaluate. It's, it's there for us to, to design in such a manner that uh, we can create uh, activities or assignment or assessment. And from the assessment, we are able to measure. And from that measure, measurement, we can actually do some form of evaluation of how far they have actually um, um, able to develop those skills. Yeah, the five clusters, the skills in the five clusters. So moving away, uh, moving from the formative assessment to the summative assessment, um, you can use activities in the class to provide information about students' current abilities from the diagnosis planning for intervention for, for, for intervention to begin. And we can use then those information to actually come up with some activities because you've got 14 weeks, right? And when you're doing CLO1, for example, it probably goes to two to three weeks. So you've got three a period of three weeks for you to, to do um, various activities how from simple to to, to uh, advance, but I, I would consider if it's new, I mean, if it's early, simple activities would, would be enough. Uh, you know, activities like buzz group discussion in the classroom where they can do some form of presentation of what, what 
um, uh, the content is all about relating to the course learning outcome. So those are uh, avenues for you to also assess what are the misconceptions and what is it that your students um, need to know, have known, and, 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 and you can focus on those um, aspects that they are still not sure. And this is what we call just in time lecture. Um, remember I told you about the, the activity that I did with that, that group of st students when they have to do the mind map and sharing and all that. So I, my task was actually to go to all the students um, going around the class to listen to them and to um, identify areas that I think or topics, that means theories in my case, that I need to revisit in my lecture because they have mis misunderstood certain things. They've got confused between one theory and the other. So that only that particular section is the one that I'm actually uh, lecturing because the rest they have understood. Right, and providing uh, receiving feedback is crucial and find before that they can actually do the um, evaluation. And that's why when we are designing for our education, what we want is actually to look at the intended learning outcomes, uh, making sure that the students can activate those verbs. We provide the formative uh, feedback, um, they improve, and the delivery and the assessment and the activities are actually meaningful for them to, to become engaged in, 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 in doing it. Um, it's not just another task, another boring task, but it's a task that you have actually made them feel excited uh, to do as realistic and re as, as connected to the real world as possible and within a time frame, which means it's, it can be done considering the individual differences. So for those who are actually doing the MCQs for the final examination questions, apart from understanding the, um, uh, the hours spent for you to come up with the table of specification, the next is for you to also figure the, the, uh, the, the, the length of time when you actually do the assessment, for your, your, your final assessment. So if it's a true false items, uh, you know, it's 20 to 30 seconds. If it's a multi multiple choice items, the, 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 the rule of thumb will be one and a half minutes. Uh, but the one and a half minutes will also include easy items as well as difficult items. So if it's easy, they will spend less than one minute, maybe between 40 to 60 seconds or even less than that. But if it's uh, more difficult, they would need that 90 seconds to actually um, answer them. So these are um, a, a, a guideline uh, for us to actually um, ident uh, decipher whether the hours that we have allocated for our final examination will be, in, will be suitable to the number of questions and the type and the difficulty level uh, of those questions, which mm -hmm. are designed based on the learning outcome. Um, of course, if you're doing it online, um, that you will probably need an extra time, technical time, uh, for the delivery of um, uh, the item, unless you're using um, uh, proctoring devices where um, there will not be any issue uh, in terms of submitting their, their work. But if they, they have to download change it to pdf submit it to you via email so those are the time of the time cons the time that you need to consider uh, to be added uh, into the the exam length so far so good do we need a 5 minutes break yeah so far so good i've got one thumbs up <laughs> the rest of you can we are we okay no, nothing in the chat. Okay. All the five classes have to be applied or implemented in a course? No, no, not all the five classes. No, 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 no. Um, uh, in your course, in, if you look at your syllabus, uh, you will see that um, uh, in your syllabus, you were assigned to one or maybe two of the classes. Uh, it's not all. But the whole program, for the whole program, you would have all the five clusters and 11, 11 uh, domain. Is that clear, Azida? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we're going to take a five minutes break. Uh, we'll be back at 10.25. All right, can we start now? So the next, uh, the next um, section is where we'll go have a goal at um, identifying suitable assessment before the final stage, which is actually uh, where you will be trying out on your own. Yeah, so let's give it a try. Oh, I need to look. Halama, <laughs> I forgot about this. I need to show you the results. So, in terms of uh, whether you're sure that you have measured, hang on a minute. Whether you have measured your students' learning in all fairness, um, well, it's more maybe than, than yes. Well, um, in order for you to know whether you have measured your students' learning in all fairness, is basically, again, looking at your learning outcome and making sure that if, if you are designing your final exam questions, you got to make sure that it's actually related to the, to the learning outcome and, and the weightage is, is correct based on the number of hours that you have spent and the topics is also assigned to the course learning outcome. So, inshallah, by just looking at that, um, you will um, have the, 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 the initial procedure of ensuring your students will be able to be uh, in, in all fairness, that you'll be able to measure what your students um, understand. And of course, the next thing is, is that's the reason why we always um, have presentation of our questions to our uh, department, you know, for clearance and all that. That's, that's a, a also a very positive um, uh, um, um, exercise where we get another opinion, in, uh, someone else's, to, another pair of eyes to actually look at the kind of questions that we have asked in view of our learning learning outcome and the and the uh, topics and all that so they will be um, you know as as someone who's actually taking the uh, the question because someone who's developing the questions will feel that everything is fine but someone who's actually reading the question will probably give you a better critical uh, view uh, for you to do improvement if there is a need to right for the answer do you know which learning outcomes that your students struggle with um that's good that you have, most of you know uh, which learning outcomes that your, your students struggle with. But the, the next question is, what do you do with that? Do you have a form of intervention? Do you have, um, um, how do you guide, uh, facilitate your students in order for them to, to, to not become struggle, to, to, to overcome those, those, those challenges? Uh, but for those who say no, you don't know, uh, you don't know which learning outcome that your students struggle with. Um, that's why we need to do the continuous quality improvement, where we actually look at the course learning outcome, the, the students' performance based on the course learning outcome, so that we know which part that needs um, needs further uh, work on it. Yeah. Right. Have your students been given feedback on which learning areas that they need to focus on? Again, I'm very happy that a majority have given feedback, so that's very good. Um, are all your final questions in the final examination valid? And and very confident to say that they are, uh, it's a yes. And I think uh, um, it will be truly, truly valid if you have actually do if uh, for the final examination questions, yeah, either MCQ and the XAs and all that. You've actually done item analysis, then then you would know. Um, that your questions are actually valid or not. And if you do have those kind of procedures, then well and good, then that's that's brilliant. Are you confident, confident that the questions you develop for your assessment are aligned with the learning outcome? And majority of you are also uh, very uh, confident, yeah, that, that you, you have uh, aligned it to your learning outcome. So that's great. Do you have questions in item bank based on the item analysis? And this is where not, not many uh, have actually done um, item analysis. So in order for us to ensure that our questions are valid, we need to do the item analysis. Um, then we will know which are good items, which are items that, when I say items, it means questions, yeah? Which items that needs to, uh, to refine or retune, fine-tune it, and which ones that needs to be removed. Have you developed a table of specification before? I think um, after, after explaining to you what table of specification is, um, if majority have not used 
table of specification. I'm not sure what, what's the reason. If you've got a final examination questions, chances are you need to have a table of specification. If you have, unless you do not have a, a final exam questions, it's a 100% uh, coursework um, course, then you would not really require a table of specification. But what would you require will be the course uh, assessment plan. You know, how many, again, the, the weightage that, that, that is associated for the, for the uh, respective assignments uh, based on the CLO. Do you refer to the le course learning outcome and planning for assessment? Alhamdulillah, 93.3% of you did, uh, but there's also some no's and maybes. So I hope uh, from the morning session, you've understood how important it is for you to actually look at the learning outcome and to really understand the learning outcome before you do any form of delivery as well as assessment. Do you refer to the topics when planning for assessment? And I, I think this is the one that people always do, right? They always look at the topics without looking at the learning outcomes. And that's the reason why we have a, a, a number of the no's and the maybes. Uh, we don't, all of us don't have problems looking at the topics, but none of us actually realize we didn't even care about the course learning outcome. We just go topic, what courses that you're going to teach and straight to the topics. Um, but the course learning outcome is the level that we're supposed to target our students. Um, when I say level here, level of thinking, level of feeling, level of, of doing uh, and all the other skills that, that's involved. So good to look at the topics, but must also all blue when you're doing for the assessment and also delivery. Right. Oh, uh, you want to know about alternative assessment, what kind of assessment, what items are appropriate or not, how to create a good assessment. Students are in class have different level of knowledge in my profession with Japanese language. They have different level of understanding. Yeah. How to make assessment more objective in a subjective field. So students, especially first year, have claimed that assessment too much, burdensome. How do I know if this is valid concern if students are just struggling to transition to university life? Which assessment are not advisable to be carried out? Other valid assessments yet or that are time effective? How to link the assessment process to students' future professional requirements? Hmm. Well, how to link assessment process to the students' future professional requirements require you to look at your course and see mm -hmm. what in what profession, in what situation would this knowledge be used in, in you know in, in the workplace. So that that will be helping your students see the closest. Remember, I told you as, as closest as possible to the real world. Um, so that's it. What level of difficulty questions? How if students give answer beyond then that the answers came, it was not taught in a class or not in the textbook, but based on logical sense, what marks level should give them? <laughs> I'm interested to know. Okay, right. So most of you want to know about the um the table of specification specification and i think even in terms of um in terms of the kind of assessment by the clo which that's what that's what we're going to be doing afterwards and um the weightage yeah uh, and the table of specification and how as i said how to become creative it comes with the experience comes with reading it comes from learning from other people so coming to this kind of training is actually good because you, you will also learn from each other hopefully okay i kind of like know what what uh what you what is needed here so let's move on why problem with this is that sometimes i have yeah Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to run through one uh, activity or one kind of assessment uh, with you uh, as an example, and then before we actually uh, before we do uh, on our own, yeah. Assuming that all of you are teaching educational psychology, so I'm going to I'm going to ask I have to ask you to to re <laughs> retune yourself. So assuming that you've got this as your cost learning outcome. Um, so the cost learning out outcome is compare the human development theories, developmental theories throughout the lifespan cycle. That's basically the, the cost learning outcome. The level of the, the cognitive is C4. Um, 
effective is A4. There's no Sakamoto, but there's interpersonal skills. So that's LOC3B. And the topic assigned to this, this particular CLO, there are many topics assigned to it, but one of the topics that's assigned to it, which I'm going to use for this particular exercise, is Bom Ryan's parenting style. Right. So um, if, if I am actually like you, being asked to teach this particular course, um, the first thing that I will look at is, alamak, sorry. Sometimes even I don't know how to use my own computer. Because it depends on where the, okay, yeah. The first thing that I will do is actually the, to look at this, the levels. These are the, this red, highlighted in red is the is the key is the clue okay so what i'll be doing is um to understand what is c4 so c4 is actually analyze and i need to understand what does analyze means analyze means breaking down information into components or parts okay in a nutshell but you can actually look at the noble and they will give you a long uh, explanation about each and every um every uh, taxonomy that's there the next is actually to also look at A4. Uh, what is A4? Effective. Effective domain. So there are five altogether. And the fourth is, on, <clears throat> is related to organization. So if it's related to organization, it, it says here, has the student combined and conceptualized a new value giving it priority? Concerned with the development of a philosophy of life. <clears throat> so basically, you are looking for someone who is trying to um, uh, develop and organize their values, right? Uh, uh, make meaning from uh, from the task, the task that you're about to design. So they have got to compare and they've got to compare the person's values, that they are, uh, the, the values that from others and their own values and, and learn from it as, as part of their philosophy of life. Okay, so that's clear. The next is actually to look at the interpersonal skills. So what are the, there are many interpersonal, various of inter, uh, sub-components or sub-attributes sub of interpersonal skills. And if you look at the noble, they will also have examples of it. So you can actually choose which ones that you, you feel that will be relevant, that will be connected to the uh, suitable for the task and the course learning outcome that you have, uh, you have uh, in, in your course. All right. So understanding all this will then make you start thinking, hmm, if I were to choose, um, you know, work ethics and integrity, or if I were to choose negotiation or self-confidence or cooperating collaboration, I would then, um, and if I want them to instill values and, and for them to organize those values, and if I want them to analyze, chances are I probably will, will have them doing doing what can you like put it in your in in the chat box what what possible what possible activities would i be be doing if i am actually um looking at um you know the ability for them to cooperate and collaborate ability for them to develop self confidence or ability for them to uh, uh, to interact with each other um, and then looking at them being able to organize the values and they're they're going to be doing analysis. What what kind of activities do you think would be suitable in my class? And this is about Bomrein parenting style. They will be the context is they will be learning about different types of parenting styles. What kind of activities would would be relevant for that? Role play, brilliant. Irhash, Muhammad Irhash, brilliant. Role play. What else? Any, any anything else apart from role play? Okay, let's just see. So what what I would do 
if okay peer learning activities okay fine because it's peer yeah uh, but that peer learning activities is very vague what kind of um, activities are we talking about here but never mind so um, um, mm-hmm. what I will probably be doing is to provide resources for the students via LMS if, uh, for them to, as a fleet learning, right? They, they learn, they read it before they come to the class. So, but when they, uh, when given the resources, they have to now identify the characteristics of um, the different types of parenting styles. So there are four, which is authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, and laissez affair or neglect. So they will, they will have to write down the characteristics of each of the, uh, um, the, uh, the different types of parenting style. And from there is where I'm going to do the activities. So this is where I'm asking them to do some kind of like a guided kind of reading where um, they read and they have to do this particular task, which I then uh, um, uh, picking up this, this notes in order to put into the different various types of um, parenting styles. Salima, I like the idea of case study because that's one, one, one uh, good uh, way to do it. So I'm giving you examples of many uh, uh, various types of uh, activities that we can actually do with our students. Yeah. Uh, I mean, or basically what I have done for my students. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to give you an example um, of what I mean by um, SLT. Forget about the FFF and SS and all that. Nah. Uh, but basically, we're talking about the SLT here. Right. Uh, if the cost, the cost learning outcome is the same, right? Compare the human developmental theories throughout the lifespan cycle, C4, A4. The learning cluster is the same, interpersonal skill. Topics is the same, Bormrein parenting style. And I know from my course outline, uh, from the syllabus, I've uh, it says that I have to spend six hours teaching this particular topic for this particular, uh, uh, based on this particular CLO. So from that six hours of that 42 hours, that I have. Why is it 42 hours? Because it's a three credit paper. So three times 14 will be 42 hours. So out of the 42 hours of, uh, uh, you know, teaching time, um, not teaching time, uh, uh, 42 hours of, of delivery, six hours is spent on this particular topic. So what I, what we can actually do, because that means if it's six hours, if I'm t- teaching undergraduate, um, if it's three hours, three hours, that means I will be t- beating them twice per week, one and a half, one and a half. So what I can do is I can actually do one and a half hours of formative assessment, another one and a half hours, uh, another another go at formative assessment, and then I can give them a summative assessment, summative assessment. But that is just an example. So you can actually just do one formative assessment, and the next is the summative assessment. That's fine. Um, that's 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 not a problem. But what I'm giving you, oh, sorry about that. See, yeah, what I'm I'm sharing with you is how how we can actually uh, develop different types of um, activities. And it's through those activities that you can actually do as formative assessment or you can actually do it for summative assessment. I have used mind map for both, for formative as well as summative. I have used role play for formative, not summative. Uh, but if I'm teaching language, I might use role play um, um, for summative. I might, if I'm actually looking, I'm doing an oral examination of my students, um, I can use role play uh, to have them uh, um, you know, act out and use the language. And from there, uh, I'm able to see how how well they, they use the language. And case study, I think Salim, uh, Salima said that right just now, um, the use of case study. I can actually use case study. And I can use the normal writing that people are all, always very familiar with, but this time with a different tinge, a tinge of reality, kind of, you know. So let's look at uh, the first one, which is mind map. Mind map is to, uh, what I want them to do is to design on various parenting styles based on readings to be shared to all modes. Uh, modes here means if it, uh, I'm talking about high flex here. So if if you have someone who's actually learning it asynchronously or online or face-to-face in front of you, you can actually use one platform that all of the three of the modalities can actually, uh, um, you know, refer to. Then they have to rate stars. 
you know, um, how well that mind map is able to explain uh, the parenting style. And what we want here is actually to compare, right? So they can actually uh, give more stars for those who, who manage to do the comparison via the mind map. Um, next is actually to do the role play. A uh, role play where the uh, lecturer can ask the students to video record of their role play if it's just too big a class and they can place them in the LMS and everyone can have a look at it at their own time. And again, they can rate uh, who's the best group and all that. So that's one, one thing. The other one is case study. Given a case, students in groups are to compare the different types of parenting styles and its impact on the children's development as portrayed in the case. And each member is to find an article to support the analysis. So notice I put here a note that this is going to be, because it's interpersonal skills that we are talking about here. So a, one group will have four members. And why it uh, four to a group? Not only four is a good number for a, for a group to really, really do work. But um, there are four different types of parenting styles. So each person will be account accountable to one type of parenting style for their group, right? So then each of them will have to find an article to support their analysis of how those um, parenting styles impact on the children's development and they provide their opinion about those issues. And when they're providing those opinion, that's related to the effective, yeah? Next, uh, uh, next possible task is actually to use, to, to do writing, but they're not just students. They are editors of a magazine on parenting and they have to write one page bulletin um, and they have to, all of them will have to write. And then in their, in their group, the four of them will have to swap their uh, write-up for others to edit. And when we say edit, it's not correcting their mistakes, but only pointing suggestions for improvement. And then uh, all of the, once they have done that, they've improved that, then they can uh, put it in the LMS for other people to provide pointers for improvement. So can you see that they're getting feedback, the formative feedback, not only from their group members, but also the other, other friends from the, the, other, the whole class. And once it's done, the lecturer can actually compile this and, and, and do it as, I mean, if it's, it's good, uh, you can rejoice it with your students by, by going the extra mile of compiling into e-bulletin and actually, you know, printing, printing it out or if it's not printing, launching it um, under the faculty or whatever uh, and making the students feel proud that they, it's not just an assignment, but it's an assignment that, that helps them to have trajectory in their learning um, and the and the best part of it if you can actually get an editor a real editor to come and have a look at the students work and 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 improve on it but i i wouldn't recommend uh, for you to go that to that extra mile until uh, unless you are teaching language if you're teaching language it would be brilliant if you can actually get um your students uh, stu um, a real editors to come and look at your students work because who knows <clears throat> they might be um, uh, I mean, the editors might be um, interested to employ these students even before they graduate. So that, that is an um, example um, of um, um, what, I, what we can do as formative assessment <clears throat> or even can be used for summative assessment. But for the summative assessment, um, in order to engage students' learning, The same course learning outcome, the same learning cluster, the same topic. This time, if you have given them all those activities in the classroom, this time is asking them to do this movie of the year, family category. The instruction is they are, um, this is if you're doing alternative assessment, yeah? Uh, so they, they have to, uh, suggest to you um, four movies they have to choose. They've got to compare those four movies. They have to show evidence of different parenting styles that has impacted um, the people uh, in the movie, the, the protagonist or whoever uh, in the movie. 
that gives impact to the audience in terms of the values and implication to development. And based on that comparison and justification, they have to then nominate um, you know, in their group which of the movies that they have selected as the best movie for family category. And of course, they have to justify. So then, how do I assure that learning has taken place here? My rub I have got to develop a rubric if this is an alternative assessment. So my rubric will be re relatively related to their ability to compare because that's the cost learning outcome. To co compare what? To compare the different types of parenting styles because that's the context from different movies as context and ability to organize the values and its impact to life. And the reason, uh, and, and of course, the interpersonal skills also can be, can be um, evaluated because it depends on the the justification that they do, the compa comparison that they do based on the four movies that they have chosen, each of them have chosen. And of course, um, never think that after you have done all this assessment that everything is fine. It's also good to get feedback from your students and getting feedback from your students can be in many ways. It can be informal after, during the class time or usual, the usual way of waiting the students for the students' reflection uh, sorry, students' evaluation of your course or asking the students to do reflection. And it's from the, their reflection, it's like a takeaway for you to know what works for them and what, what does not work for them and how that can influence your, your practices as well. And of course, the ever, ever conventional way of looking at the students' performance. Right. Um, now, any, any questions before that? Sorry. Any questions before that? Because you're about to do you're about to do your activity now. Thumbs up if there's no questions. Okay, I've got one thumbs up that's good enough. Okay. Uh all right. Right. On your own. If you are given this information, what possible assessment can be derived from this learning outcome? Um, that's how we calculate the weightage. Lah. Uh, within 14 hours have been spent for this particular topic out of the 42, 42 hours. So if 14 over 42 times 100, you'll, be, you'll have 33.3. So the weightage is 30%. Don't crack your head with the 3.3 and all that. So just, just round it up to 30%. And how did I get that 14, 14, 14 hours? Four hours for this particular topic, another four hours for this particular topic, and six hours for this particular topic. And the course learning outcome is this. That's the level. That's the learning cluster. So I want you to think what would be the right, uh, what would be the appropriate activities that you would want to do, having to know that they they will have to do this, and the skills that we are talking about is this, and the level is this. Mm, how shall I do this? Huh? Uh, Maybe you want to you want to screenshot this um, so that you will have it. If I if I go to the next slide, you will not be lost because I'm about to to go to the next slide, which is actually the the Mentimeter. That's where I want you to. That's where I want you to tell me three possible activities that you would do based on that particular um, particular situation. Wait, I'm trying to see where did I... Let's see if I, if I share this. Mak, empat orang je baca ni jawab. 
we have only four people and you, you ask him to use case study, you ask to describe, role play, show, fishbowl activity. Okay. What else? Okay, draft, I guess, draft the manifesto on GST. Okay, interview-based report. I, I presume interviewing uh, who? Who would be the one that you're interviewing? The custom officers, company? Opinion piece for magazine, video, anal anal analyze, video and analyze. Okay, mind map, analyze new articles. Problem, case study situation. Okay, that's that's good enough. I think um, that's pretty much. So what what we what we are looking at here, alamak quiz. Um, what we're looking at here is um, the fact that it does sound as if case study would be the right the the appro most appropriate um, way to um, to to use as a form of activities in the classroom as well as a possible question when you're prov providing the, the in your final exam question you could actually provide uh, an information in the form of a case study for them to have a, a, a response i mean to, for them to respond to it right so um that's that's um very much um uh, interrelated yeah into what what we are um, actually doing so it does it does look like as if the more people are actually writing it's still case study as the main <clears throat> the main, um, how should I say, the main um, preference, yeah? Good. Well done. So let's see um, example of how this can be done, even if we are doing um, case study. We can actually ask the students to uh, pretend or we give a scenario where the students are our custom offices because this is related to GST and it's the I'm not very good at this but yeah um, so they are in charge of the investigation so they need to evaluate the issue they need to evaluate maybe given a, a, a situation of a company who did not fulfill uh, uh, or did not abide to the to the tax uh, or the custom duty or whatever so they are the custom officers and they will have to evaluate those issues and provide the evidence about the company which deals with the export of goods and or fail or to avoid to, or to adhere uh, to the taxation so they need to evaluate what is the strength what's the weaknesses before providing a solution in terms of strategies so this one i'm just giving and this is just one of the clo there are four clos altogether so we can actually um, combine those CLO or we can also ask them to come up with um, a proposal um, as the summative assessment. So that's that's one, one uh, uh, example. So if let's just say uh, this particular course is a 60-40, uh, has a 60-40 uh, 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 mode, where 60% is the coursework and 40% is the final exam. So understanding the weightage is important because that's how you will develop the final exam questions. So let's just say, uh, uh, because it's 30%, so you know already 30% of the total questions. So it doesn't matter how many questions that you want. Of course, you've got to rem remember, I told you the number of hours that you need to, to consider based on the number of questions that you have. And the type of questions that you have, whether it's difficult or is it factual or it requires them to do analysis or whether it's a short essay, long essay, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So having all that into consideration, you will then now know um, the total number of questions. And assuming that your quest there are 40 questions that you have um, because it's an MCQ or I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not an MCQ, maybe it's a short answer kind of questions. Or if it's not a short answer question, it's an essay. So um, it will be, if it's an essay, it will be 12 marks. If it's a, uh, an MCQ, uh, maybe you want to ask the, the lower level questions. You know, if it's C6, that means you can ask questions from C1, C2, C3, C4, C5 until C6, right? So maybe C6, you want to ask questions in the essay, but for the C1 to C5, 
three maybe or C4 maybe, you want to ask via MCQ, uh, the multiple choice questions, then you have a maximum of 12 questions because there are th the weightage is 30%. 30% of the total questions or 30% of the total marks uh, is actually for this particular course, uh, for this particular topic and this particular course learning outcome. Is that clear? Okay, thank you. Now that you have understood, uh, the next thing that I need you to do is to scan this. And before you can do that, um, could you please uh, make sure that you are you log in uh, either if you've got a Padlet account, like, uh, um, um, log in through that Padlet account. If you don't, uh, uh, log in through your Gmail, Gmail account. Again, I have to. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Adek, for doing that for me. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that's it. That's the Padlet. Um, so if you can go there, um, what you will see is. Is this right? Um, this is the example uh, that I'm giving you, uh, the ones that, that, that the one that I shared with you just now. But what I want you to do individually now in your uh, okay, um, umu uh, afterwards, afterwards. What we're going to do after this is that, but for now, individually, I want you to download this so that you can fill in. So if you click on that, uh, this is where you put, you put your name, your faculty, the name of the course that you're going to use, one course only. So you are going to be assigned to groups later on. So in your groups, each member is to fill in the must fill in information individually. So you're going to do it individually first. So choose one learning outcome, one learning outcome from your course. Just one learning outcome. So you fill in uh, the, the, what is the course learning outcome. And the way in which you fill in, you need to identify what's the level. The level of the C, if there's A, if there's P, what are the levels? And for the learning clusters, what will be the learning cluster? And then um, uh, you suggest, based on now that you've understood the kind of um, um, activities that, that we can actually use in real in uh, in view of the learning outcome and the, le the learning cluster just try and fill in what kind of activities that you would put in in the formative assessment and what kind of activities that you would consider to do for your summative assessment and of course don't forget the topics because the topics is actually the context topics in relation to the course learning outcome so you have to look at your syllabus here for this um and then what we going to do afterwards is we're going to divide you into groups there are well since there are there are not many of you here right there are about 40 of you here so we'll stop to group four. Oh, no 40 yeah. uh, takpelah. 10 groups 10 groups so there will be four four to a group four to a group uh, all, uh, if you are assigned to group one so just click on this and add your document so that you can, uh, we can fill it up in this particular space. Can you do that first? That uh, I'm going to give you about ten minutes to do this, um, and I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when, 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 when the time ends. Before, uh, I mean, do you have any questions? Okay. Recorded. So once you're back, oh, thank you. I, I love to see faces. Thank you for those who switch on their video camera. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Um, for those who um, have done it, can you please now add to your respective groups um, your document so that 
um, we can all have a look at it. And the next thing that I want you to do, any questions before that? Any questions? Uh, we are trying to type inside, but we don't know how to type inside, but we already discussed how to fill up the, yeah. um, the template. Ah, uh, you we have to download to discuss. Okay. Uh, yeah. We managed to discuss, but couldn't uh, type into that. Lah. Yeah. Oh, all right. If that's the case, uh, perhaps would you want to start the ball rolling by sharing with us? Uh, Dr. Ken, Florence Ken, will do. Yeah, Dr. yeah, Florence. Ken. Um, <laughs> but it's through our discussion, three of us. Okay. Um, we actually have um, we we have uh, upload our LOs there, four of them, but we pick one of them, which is uh to write. This is research methodology paper, and then so um we are asking them to produce a final proposal. Uh, at, at the end, however, that is for submittive the forty percent. And for sorry, sixty percent. And then, <clears throat> um, are you sharing? Do you want to share anything? Uh, sharing anything ah? Because we we only managed to upload the LOs and didn't manage to complete this this table. But we we went through the formative and summative. Yeah. Uh, so so me showing it the showing the table will be will be helpful for you to know what you're talking about here. Uh, or, just now, yeah. So we are like filling in. So the format. Okay. <laughs> to, to, me, to reach me, there. Okay. 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 Right. So to yeah. So the topic is uh research methodology, mm -hmm. right? And then um, weightage is hundred percent, and then hours spent uh depend on course lah. My one is three credit hours. Um and then uh yeah uh for the course we have four LOs but we are taking the the preparing research proposal at the end because the course is building them to prepare the research proposal okay. and then the cluster oh, oh. <laughs> cluster um is uh the higher one uh, uh C four I think five <laughs> also and then uh formative um formative uh week seven. We are going to ask them to uh, present their. Uh, we, we are going to see the alignment of their presentation, um, of their research problem, research objective, and uh, sorry, research question and objective, and then their method, and then uh, that's the first uh some uh, formative, and then uh week ten they are going to, yeah uh, uh this is a group work uh, the formative. And then uh, they are going to complete uh and uh, the second part of their presentation on their um on uh what they have put together. <clears throat> and then um so the submittive will be um the uh, handout uh, the 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 final written handout. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the the second second formative, right? They will put the theory in already. Yeah, thanks. So the final the final summative is uh, individual or is it still group? Uh individual. Individual. Um mm. where they have to do what? They have to write the what was the instruction again? The research proposal for oh, the, yeah, uh, oh, their research proposal. Course. Yeah, for their coursework punya proposal. Lah. Right, 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 right. right. I just want to add on, Prof, with what uh, Dr. Florence was sharing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the component, uh, the summative assignment, of course, we can uh, do that uh, submission of a uh, final research proposal. Yeah. For mm -hmm. summative. Mm -hmm. But for final exam, uh, what we can do, uh, uh, we can actually uh, ask questions that relates to ethics in writing a research proposal or, you know, how do you uh, incorporate ethics element? When you are doing research, you know, maybe we can do that as one of the final exam questions. Yeah. For, do for you that, have final for that. exam questions in your course? Yes, we do. Because it's actually 60 and 40. Okay. 60 basically uh, comprise of our proposal writing normally. Maybe we can give it like 40% for a proposal writing and another 20% can go on in the form of either quizzes or, you know, all that stuff. And then 40% basically is going to be final exam because 
most of our master's program. The one Dr. Florence shared is actually for research methodology for master's student. So okay. that forty percent normally, what we will do, we'll ask them two questions. So we can embed actually elements of ethics, for example, in writing a proposal and things like that, lah. Like, yeah. Because yeah. the learning cluster is related to ethics, is it? I'm sorry. Ah uh, yes, yes, definitely. When you're writing your research for a, a research methodology, you can't run away from ethics. Mm. Ethics in research, right? So yeah. definitely, you can actually ask one question that relates yeah. to that, lah. Like, yeah. Yeah, uh, as long as it's actually uh, the learning cluster is on ethics and professionalism related to the particular course, then you're you're fine for, to ask all those kind of questions. Yeah. Um. Uh. And 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 it's logical too because we're talking about research. Um, yeah. Research. Just either quality or quantity. You have the different aspect of uh, ethics that you need Correct. to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Adhere. All right. Report. Correct. 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 Yeah. Okay. Let's see if people have actually. And in Alamak, I've lost mine. Oh, okay. Right. So group what? Group two, group three has written a applied approaches. Oh, this is us. We just managed to post our CM. Yeah, okay. about LOs then. Approaches and techniques used in research of Chinese studies, including digital technology related software. Just now we were reporting of our LOs uh, yeah. for, yeah. So this is the prepare a full research proposal for Chinese stu studies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Right. Hey, what did I do? Okay. Um. Anyone else wants to share? Because that not many. Uh. Not well. Ideally, was for me to get um people to set. Share and then you do it among your groups to see you know whether your activities are okay or not, um, and what you can improve. What other other ways that you can actually do before um, before you um, before we regroup. But since not many has actually shared, and um, who wants me to look at whose work now? Which one? Any volunteers? You tell me which group and which ones that belongs to you. Uh, sorry, bro. <laughs> I'm just like wondering uh, if there's any who do the psychomoto assessment. So if uh, can share, I'm not sure. Yeah. Are you doing it? Mm, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> but I'm wondering how. Yeah, I mean, it's like the better way of the psychomoto. Lah, sebab kemarin we do the cognitive kind of. Yeah, but uh, uh, see, the best is for us to actually look at your CLO. If there is Sakomoto, then only we can we can uh, see whether it makes sense or not. You know, Sakomoto is actually doing right, so it isn't. Uh, if you are teaching um, uh, social science, uh, people might think that's difficult for us to actually write Sakomoto and all that. But it's actually doing action. Um, if they are doing something uh, in the activity, that's considered as psychomoto too. Because in the psychomoto, it's not just about behavior. The components of the, uh, the, the behavior is related to either they perceive, uh, they receive, they're the level they can. Uh, when we talk about... Hang on a minute. Yeah, for the psychomoto, there are ah, oh, I've deleted it. Look, I don't have it here. No, I don't. Well, if it's psychomoto, there is a you have the 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 different levels, just like the effective. The one that I showed you in in here is is not it's it's solo solo method. Uh, I'll get back to you about the psychomoto thingy. But it, uh, would you want to share, Mas, yours? Uh, 
which which ones are you, which one is it that that you you did? Well, I, I didn't I didn't put inside the padlet. <laughs> oh, yeah. But okay, for example, right? Um, because uh, because because I'm from engineering, kan? So engineering memang saya komoto tu memang part tu quite uh, a number. But hmm. we were wondering, like, um, I think we we the assessment part, uh, macam. Yeah, could you share yours so that I can? Uh, saya tak mind? ada pula sekarang. That's sebab saya tengah ada satu lagi meeting lain. That's the problem. Cuma oh. tertarik dekat saya komoto tu lah. I just, I, tapi I think my my part is ah uh, yang yang saya uh, kind of like nak tahu lebih adalah ah uh, the the learning and the assessment kita boleh bagi dia buat lab and then like they can do the perform the laboratory and so on. Tapi hmm. what? Uh, we always get uh, ni how do macam the rubric yang kita guna untuk assess dia punya skills tu kan hmm. so itu yang kita agak tak pasti whether we really get it uh, whether they achieving the skills that psychomoto tu means I think it's more on the rubric side ataupun macam mana nak bagi markah uh, because we they can complete the experiments uh, of course they can give us the output and so on but is that that uh, my my question yang selalu main tu adalah Uh, does when we assess through the rubric, does it really reflective the skills that they have performed semasa buat tu? Ha. Yang, hmm. uh, sebab tu lah, we have to look at the learning outcome and the cl- learning cluster tadi. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you know already the and the topic, so the mm-hmm. topic becomes the context, mm-hmm. right? Katalah, to- topic, give me an example of the topic. Katalah uh, uh, macam to thermodynamic, katalah. Uh, thermodynamic, ya, ya, ya. Okay. So if you if you want them uh, for formative assessment, you feel that uh, uh, maybe your your cost. See, I'm just giving maybe's maybe's because I'm not for that cost learning outcome. <laughs> so maybe your cost learning outcome is explain uh, the theory right uh-huh. uh, related to whatever whatever engineering. So one of the topic is actually th- thermodynamics. Uh-huh. So they have to explain. So rather than asking them to explain the usual way of pre- presentation, you they can actually explain in terms of uh, role playing the you know like how they they how they um, they show the boils boils um, boils, um uh. theory where we can ask the students to in in a group they 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 act it out as if they are the molecules and they they gather mm. together. The, the, you know, the more they they are closer, they get friction mm. and become powerful. So that's under uh, that's fundamental. Uh, explaining they demonstrate, they demonstrate how their understanding of the explaining. Correct. So uh-huh. when they're doing to it, it's also part of the explanation, right? Mm, 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 mm. Betul, betul, betul. Because until and unless they understand uh, the the concept, they will not be able to behave accordingly. Hmm. Hmm. So maksudnya kat sini kita memang banyak dekat formatif belakang prof kat sebab unless kalau we do the summative tu kita hanya boleh buat macam lab test where we actually like tengok betul-betul dia buat uh, for the summative for the final marks. Tapi kalau for, final eh, exam yes. Kalau final mm-hmm. exam tak boleh nak buat apalah. Ah, you know, kan. That much creative that in the final exam except to hmm. make sure that the questions are re- really related to the CLO. But if you're doing as a coursework If mm. you want to consider alternative assessment, they can be astronauts <laughs> working in NASA uh, trying to figure out how, you know, it's a form of a case uh, study but relating them in a context yeah. of a real world yeah, so that yeah. they will see how learning th- thermodynamics will be relevant to them in the future when they're actually mm. working. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, all right. Alright, thank you, Prof. Iru, you raise your hand. Yeah, I, yeah. I got a question, a uh, very similar question as uh, what was raised by Dr. Mas a while ago. Mm-hmm. So this is more of that psychomoto. I think basically when you're talking about arts and social sciences, we have this. We also struggle how to incorporate that psychomoto element in in our our mm-hmm. course uh, learning outcome. Yeah, CLO. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of the thing that We the cause that we find it much easier to incorporate that psychomotor element is when we are talking about industrial training for undergraduate mm-hmm. student. Yeah, for example, like uh, if you want to test uh, test on punctuality, mm-hmm. so we can actually track back at you know how they will basically go and report for duty on daily basis, right? So right. we find find that you know when we are talking about internship per se, it's much easier for us to. Uh, capture the element of uh, psychomotor rather than you know all other courses a bit difficult for arts and social sciences lah yeah so mm. so 
that's what we have been doing yeah Mm, but that, that's what I'm saying. Um, sometimes we feel it's difficult, but that's uh, the the whole notion of us trying to understand the context. When we understand the context, that means the topics. Yeah, we will become more creative um, rather than the normal way of doing things. Um, we that's why we have to. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, my in my in my very cluttered mind right now. I don't even know where I kept the. The yeah, I have it. I have it here in a book. I don't have. I can't show it to you all, right? Um, when we're talking about psychomoto, what are the sub attributes of the psychomoto? We are talking about ability for them to English version. So there are seven, seven sub attributes, right? Under under psychomoto, the first one is set. I wish I've got a visualizer so I can show it to you. It's like that, <laughs> the one that I'm having right now. So I'll just read it to you. The first, the first is um, P one is perception. They perceive. So you can actually, uh, 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 describe what you what you fathom them doing when they're doing perception. So words, it will be related to your cost learning outcome. So your cost learning outcome that will be related to perception will be like choose, detect, isolate, distinguish, select. So they, they perceive that this is the right thing. This, this, is, the, this is how you organize things. They, that's it. They're based on their perception. So you can actually ask them to explain or they do the, the, the selection of things, they relate or they identify. By doing those identification, you are, they are actually showing you their behavior, their psychomoto, in view of perception, P1. P2 is origination. They construct. This one is when they do it, they construct. But they can also compose, construct in the sense of mind map. Uh, in my mind map, there is P2. When they construct the mind map, that's how I, I evaluate them. How well did they construct their mind map? How, how, did they, how, how are they able to arrange the information in the, in, uh, that they have found in the theories to come up with that mind map? So P2 can also occur in origination. That's P, uh, second level of the Sakomoto. The, prof, sorry, Prof. Uh, just sorry, one that's question. Not, that's origination. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, Prof. Uh, you know, the, uh, the one uh, Dr. Florence uh, presented a while ago on research proposal, mm -hmm. can that come under that origination? Because student comes up with their, comes up with their own uh, research proposal, right? Can that right, come? But, yeah. but it all depends on your course learning outcome. It, yeah. it all depends on your verb. What, what was the verb? The verb was? To produce. Would that be okay? To produce a research proposal. To produce. Good job. Yeah. Why am I not able to share anymore? Wait, I'll just read yours then. Um, it says to prepare. Prepare. Uh, yeah. Can to prepare. Yeah. You can, you can, but you don't have to. You can. Yeah, okay, okay. Huh. Uh, when they're preparing the proposal, you can, but you don't have to because the word prepare um, is suitable for either C3, apply, or C6, create, or A4, organizing values. So that's why you have the organizing values where you, you talk about the ethics, right? So that's, that, that's brilliant. That's good enough. But the ability for them to prepare, you don't even have to, you don't have to measure, but you can actually guide them how they, they, they do the preparation. So never, the thing that we have to be clear is that if your course learning outcome says that, you measure accordingly. But if you want to include something else like the psychomoto, you can guide them 
but the the information or the the measurement if you if you, even if you you tell them that in terms of their ability to originate it's like a 5 over 10 that 5 over 10 score is not going to be included in their 100% but that 5 over 10 is giving them some indication in the form of formative assessment in order to help them to improve uh, is that clear Is that clear? Be why am I saying that? Because if it's not part of your CLO, don't measure. But you can guide. But if it's part of your CLO, including the learning cluster, you must measure. And the way in which you measure is by if it's if it's something that's intangible like ethics and all that, you can start using the rubric. After all, if you're using proposal, you cannot run away from uh, using rubric, right? You definitely have to. Ethics is in the cluster. Pardon? Ethics is in the cluster, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's why I say you cannot run away from using the rubric because that's the only way for you to measure ethics. Okay, let's see. Um, anyone else wants to share their... I don't know why it doesn't come out. My... All right. Are you able to see the what is it that you, you can see padlet. now? You can see the palette. Okay, that's good. That's what I want you to see. <laughs> okay. Um, who wants to try? Somebody says somebody speaking this now. Which group do you belong to? Okay, then I'll stick at random then. Uh, let's see. Okay. Understanding service, service molecular model, characteristics of services. So this is for services management. So I, I assume this is management management school of management right okay course learning outcome identify the basic of service and its characteristics so the learning outcome is c2 loc2 which means loc2 will be cognitive am i right farinda loc2 will be cognitive can cognitive yes yeah okay so you have they have to identify the basic services and they've got to that there, there is some form of critical thinking going on here because cognitive yeah. is related to thinking. Thinking skills, yeah. Right. So for your formative, you said that you would want them to work in group, to analyze the video, watch and identify the tangible and intangible aspects of a service and identify characteristics of services. Okay. Um, and this particular, when you talk about services here, the context will be related to service molecular model. What is this, huh? Or uh, it's a model. It's, it's just like your theory just now. You have oh, a theory. theory. Uh, yeah. yeah. So okay. you have okay. you have a model to um so that okay. they can understand what service is all about. Brilliant. So the service can be in any form of service, right? Yes. Uh, and but the, the the theory that we're using is the molecular model, the service molecular model. Yes, yes. Where there's um uh, intangible and uh tangible bits in there for them to under to understand. Okay. Brilliant. So, yeah, watching the video um, or a, a movie or even... Um, uh, even a case study. Yeah, even, yeah, a, case study. even a case study, correct. Uh, but then again, they, they, just, they just need to identify. So, you don't have to ask them to go and do a lot of things. They, they just need to identify. It's a C2 level. Mm -hmm. It's correct. not that difficult. So, having the video is just, it's just fine. Uh, summative, draw a molecular model based on a type of service. Mm, what do you mean by that? I mean, um, now they have got, uh, they've got to pick uh, a service. Maybe because uh, through the video, they, they, they know about something. But then they, they have to pick a service, a type of service. It could be, you know, just, a, 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 um, you know, you go for, you service your car. So uh, that sort of car service. So what are the... Uh, the the intangible and tangible bits that you can find from a service from servicing your car. So they have got to draw it out in that the circular model. 
Okay, understood. So, um, the ability for them to identify the basic services and its characteristics will be related to how well they are able to draw, to show yeah. which mm -hmm. tangible and tangible. So, they've got to sing. Like, they definitely will have to sing. If not, they yeah, won't be yeah, able yeah, to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, brilliant. Anyone else? Any suggestions? How, uh, if there's anything else that she, I mean, uh, Farinda can, can do apart from watching video? For this kind of assignment? Prof, okay. Sorry, I just yeah. want to ask about that formative assessment for this hmm. particular group. It says hmm. watch and identify the tangible and intangible aspects of the service, right? Mm -hmm. How do you basically going to assess okay. that? <laughs> how would uh, you assess that? Yeah. You just uh, watch and then what do you do with that? And identify how do you do the identification? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe, maybe um, I can give marks in terms of if you identify four tangible and uh, another four intangible aspects. Is it uh, kind of a, 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 is it a verbal assist assessment or what? Is it like verbally they're going to just uh, mention and then you're going to give marks based on that ver verbal uh, whatever, you know? Yeah, they, or they can write it down or verbal. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, as long as, you know, I think if, uh, in, in a way, this, is, this can also work as a peer teaching for the rest of the class also. Okay. They see different, wouldn't different wouldn't that be good for us to have, like, probably give them a quiz question based on this? You know, like uh, identification possible, of possible. I, I can, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. A quiz would be fine, also, where I can be drawing and then I ask them whether it's correct or not. Certain certain things or uh, what? What do they want to put in? Yep, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, quiz is like the normal la. We want to do something that is like, <laughs> okay. uh, something that is you know, worthwhile for them to do and make sense to them that whatever that they're learning is actually related to their real world. Watching a video. The application of the learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. They can see that how this, this service molecular model is everywhere. It's a matter of me identifying it now. You know, I'm going to the barber shop. I can still assess so that that's that's where yeah yeah that that, that makes basically it. yeah you go you go to a barber then you assess whether you know what are the core your core benefits that you get blah 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 yeah 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 whether they massage your face and do facial <laughs> for you you wanted to have a haircut but they do the extra mile of you know doing whatever they they need to do on your face so um I totally understand this um uh, it's just that I think that was a pertinent question how are we going to evaluate in terms of um uh, the tool of measurement so. Um, I think presumably you either you will have a checklist if it's very clear clear cut then you will have a checklist or you can also have a rubric where they can actually do the same thing. See my 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 uh, my um, my intention for today was for you all to have a go at discussing um, you know in your groups uh, if you had shared all of you. Um, you know your your own respective uh, courses, uh, but I know I know the 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 uh, Doctor Florence Florence was it, and 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 yes, yes. yeah um have actually done that in advance. They've already uh because they come from the same faculty, so they've already discussed and came up with one. Uh, what I wanted all of you to do is actually within your group to 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 share and 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 provide. Um, responses just like what we're doing right now but because there's not many so we'll do it for everyone um, the point is um, if we have um, like this we can actually uh, also come up with a very 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 easy very simple rubric where we can provide that rubric to our students the same rubric that we're going to use for the summative That same rubric you're going to give during your formative assessment to your students. So the peers will use the, the, the rubric to evaluate how well did their, uh, their, their peer uh, identify uh, the, ba the basic services and the characteristics when they were describing the services of barbershop, maybe so what someone else will do will do on um, car, going to the uh, service, car services. The other one can go and do something on hotel, you know, different various types of services. And everybody will be learning that there are many contexts that we are talking about here. And this particular model is actually suitable in all our lives. 
correct, so same, prof. Sorry? That's correct, Prof. Uh, so the same rubric can be used in your summative assessment. And the beauty part of doing that is uh, I had that, that, that moment where I came up with my own rubric um, and I shared with my students during one of the activities. And, and the, the, the best part of giving rubric at, in, in, on your first day of class is that you know for sure your students will never look at it when they're doing their, their formative assessment. So the minute they do their formative assessment, they, the, there's a moment of silence. Uh, because they realize, we, I ask them to swap, just like what I'm going to ask you to do. You know, you look at your friend's work and give feedback. So they swapped, and before they did they, they did anything, there was a moment of silence, and I said, "Why are you also quiet?" I said, "We're quiet because we know already what we're going to get." Because that was the first time they actually look at the at the rubric without doing the when they did the task they didn't look at the rubric that was the first time they did the, the rubric and I said I gave you right on the first day yeah 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 yeah. you did on the first you, you gave us on the first day but we didn't look at it so we now know where we got it wrong we will never get full mark okay then they provide the feedback to your, their students and there's there's one incident where they say we're not clear about you know how do we how do what do you mean by this and true enough, even I was not sure about what I meant when I, when I designed that rubric. So we negotiated and I told them, because the cost learning outcome is this, what I wanted was this. And they said, oh, maybe we can do this. So there was a negotiation between the students and me, preparing, uh, uh, repairing the rubric that I have created. And that's the, the very rubric that I am actually going to be using when I'm doing their summative, when they're doing their summative assessment. Is that clear? Okay. Um, so that's good. That's that's one from Farinda. Let's see who else. Okay. Right. This is for. Why is it that I cannot turn oh my okay? Um I presume this is about business and specifically this is accounting. Changes in business structures, the topic, the cost learning outcome membincangkan sebab sebab penstrukturan semula syarikat dan implikasi ke atas perakaunan. So this is definitely accountancy. Um uh, accounting. So um looking at the topics is actually changes in business structure. Uh this is actually P2. Uh tadi siapa tadi? Um, Mas wanted to know uh, what what can we do with P2 so this is a P2 punya cost learning outcome memang satu-satunya ya yeah? uh, P2 ni sahaja kan tak ada tak ada lain dia tak ada cognitive lah memang nak tengok uh, Sakomoto sahaja ya yes yes bro okay right uh, and the learning outcome is leadership autonomy and responsibility so Tentu lah kena tahu apa tu P2. So P2 is set. So what is set? Sekejap. Yeah. P2 is set. It's readiness to act. It includes mental, physical, and emotional sets. These three sets are dispositions that predetermine a person's response to different situations. So basically, you want to look at their response. So ability for them to respond when they are discussing about the reasons for restructuring in the company in relation to accountancy, accounting, atas uh, implikasi ke atas perkawanan when they have when they do restructuring what happens so um, the formative assessment oh, kind of like this it's a role play because usually these are the very people who going, who's going to tell you that they, we need to do a restructuring now because we need to cut costs uh, no more deans will from the deputy dean straight to the um, you know, or maybe no no longer head of department um, all the, 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 the deputy device chances will go straight to the deans to, to, to communicate. Chotola, that's in the university. So in this case, it's a role play. Students act as shareholders, board of directors, government and other stakeholders. They have to discuss about how they have 
uh, they have to restructure their company and how it's going to impact on their finance. So that's the that's why the topic is changes in business structure. So you can have role play. You can uh, for the summative, it's a group project and presentation. Students have to write a report analysis is based on a real-life business restructuring case. So that's using case study. So the key here is to understand the elements of uh, P2 and the elements of leadership, autonomy, and responsibility when you are designing the rubric. Sounds like rubric lah because you have to write a report. I mean, students write a report. When they write a report, chances are you will have some form of rubric um uh especially when there's analysis and all that so yeah questions so memang tak nak ambil langsung langsung cognitive huh? it's just p2 saja so if it's p2 saja you really really need to understand what is the p2 uh in terms of the in terms of the sub attribute of the c uh, of the p2 um, they they know and act upon a sequence of steps. So what are the sequence of steps? They reorganize their ability. They show their desire uh, to to do to dwell in the process. So those are all the sub attributes of set in Sakomoto level two. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Prof can share one on effective. Uh? Some one example on effective people who has given effective as example boleh tak share Kejap, ya yeah, nak kena cari itulah I tak tahu can anyone who did effective volunteer to tell me which one I should be looking at what did I do now oh no 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 siapa mau buka satu satu lah ni pula Does this have A? Nordina ada A tak kat sini? Tak ada ya? Ah, tak ada prof. Okay. Okay. Siapa ya yang ada yang tahu yang yang mana yang dia punya yang ada A? Kalau tak Eh ni apa? Eh ni I punya ada ada. Hmm, tak tahu apa dia yang ni. Uh, that's why when you're doing this it's best that you write what is the C level, what's the P level, what's the A level, what's the uh, um, the learning cluster, so that you are clear um, what is it that you, you want to do before you do your case study. We, you see, this particular workshop is about how to identify the appropriate assessment. If it's a workshop on rubric development, that information is very crucial because when you want to develop your rubric, it has got to tie back to your learning outcome. So if you don't indicate the learning outcome in with clarity, which means you don't put the C level, the A level, the P level, then uh, we will not know what are the components that you will need in your rubric, you know? So bear that in mind. Have I look at number nine? This is also C2. Oh, that's the one that we did not ready. C4. Hmm. Lah, I would encourage if you want to do quizzes, I, I kind of like quizzes. That's 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 very uh, my students also love quizzes, especially if you're teaching undergraduate. Uh, but uh, uh, if you want to encourage assessment as learning. Uh, since you've got already a, an item bank that you want you want to use for your for your students to to you know to have to grasp the 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 fundamentals in in your course in in, in your um uh, in your course then you can actually 
have that in uh, your know, LMS where you indicate the options though. When when they when when they answer the 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 question, if they answer it wrong, they will also be given some notes about why they got it wrong. If they answer it right, uh, also some notes, a little bit of notes to say why that one is the right answer. That process, that that process of, of having them going through many many times, because you want you want to see then. Um, how many times your students are able to to answer the questions um, in order for them to be able to grasp before their summative. Their summative will be in the final exam. So in order for them to be able to do some form of practice before they, they go for the uh, final exam. Of course, you will not ask the same question in the final exam, but of similar difficulty and, you know, uh, in terms of the content. But the point is, if they've already understood the fundamentals, like this one, electronic, not sebut pun, I tak tahu, spectroscopy. Um, so I'm sure there are lots of um, uh, terminologies that they will have to remember. Uh, and 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 this kind of terminologies can be easily misunderstood. You know, one can be poly, polyatomic, can be, can be, misunderstood as something else <clears throat> so help helping them to grasp the fundamentals of the of the course uh, in a form of a quiz where even the options gives them some notes about what it is helps them to you know to to understand better because you have to got to understand some of the students mm, some have got some sound background of engineering, especially if they come from diploma. But some who are fresh grad, fresh from the school foundation, they might not have that much of uh, information compared to those uh, some, some students. So having a go at their own rate, no matter how many times they go about uh, doing the quizzes, will help them in their, in their assessment as learning. Yeah. So since it's numeracy, I'm assuming that um, your formative assessment has some form of calculation. Lah. Am I right? Yes, yes, bro. Mm. So um, um, it's, it's, uh, and it's very interesting that you have a 3D punya thingy um, asking them to do the, the design and all that and then having them to do the calculation. That, that is very uh, interesting because if this, is the kind of thing that they will be doing when they are living, when they when they go and work. If they come from this particular, I mean, with this kind of knowledge in the in the workforce in the industry, they will be doing this. Then it makes all sense for them to do, you know, uh, using three D printing lah, pola pola, and all that because they need to know the the right parameters. Engineers can know the terminologies. Right, I'm still searching for the A. Uh, yang ni mengetahui peraturan hmm. peraturan dalam bahasa Cina klasik rasanya yang ni pun bukan course learning outcome kan nah, yang ini yang pelajar dikenaki melalui satu essay menggunakan masalah mentangkan lebih melibatkan CLO3 ok so maybe ialah mengetahui tu macam course learning outcome macam tak kena pula kan we have to uh, maybe we have to got to look at the course learning outcome uh, mengetahui will be understanding so understanding is not a behavioral kind of verb so we, if uh, what you probably want to see if it's CLO uh, if it's actually mm, is it identify use uh, rules in classic um, Chinese so those are the kind of um, uh, keywords lah, the course learning outcome ni so that one has got to be clear. So we are talking about rules in Bahasa Cina Klasik. Pelajar dikenaki menulis satu essay kecil dengan menggunakan Bahasa Cina Klasik. Pementangan diadakan dalam kelas. Dan bahasa pembincangan. Alright. Um, pelajar menjadikan soalan-soalan kuis berdasarkan senarai perkataan yang diberikan. Kuis diadakan setiap dua minggu. Okay. Itulah yang ni kalau boleh lah. Uh, find out where or in what situation would these students be doing Classic classical Chinese. Um, where? In a theater? While reading? 
in reading uh, uh, where uh, how is this knowledge going to be used in the real world Sometimes when writing also, we need some, some of the, 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 sometimes we cannot write in too, too modern. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, maybe in the uh, newspaper title, or maybe when you want to uh, name a shop or whatever. Okay. You've already said that. So instead of students being students, you can actually tell them to become newspaper columnists for Sinchu Jitpo, for example. And mm -hmm. they are uh, to write on something. Uh, I don't know, uh, situation. So they are to to look at nampak macam perbezaan makna perkataan bahasa Cina klasik dengan moden. Yang ni lah susah untuk I nak tengok because the cost learning outcome ni macam ada problem ni. Because mengetahui is understand. Understand is not a, a verb that we can actually observe. So maybe you have to read. Yeah, that's why just now I I, 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 I also mentioned uh, there's actually few topics that cover this CLO. But then I just choose one of them lah. Uh -uh. But the CLO uh -huh. itself, the CLO. I'm uh -huh. talking about the word mengetahui ni. Yeah, mengetahui ni understand. Yeah, not not like uh, aplikasi or whatever. Right? Correct, correct. So dia susah. Kalau if you're asking them to compare, then you 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 probably want to use the word mengetahui. Memahami. Okay. Huh? Oh, memahami. Is it different? Like the new memahami. ones is different, is it? Memahami, mengetahui. How do you know that? Yeah. They <laughs> Yeah. yeah, when they can answer the difference between two uh, so you're asking them to compare, kan? Sebenarnya yeah. you're asking them That's to why I got some quiz. <laughs> huh. So, uh, dekat situ lah, the, uh, maybe uh, the department has got to look at the cost learning outcome lah so that you are clear. You are asking them to compare, so you will ask, uh, you put themselves as editors uh, and asking them to compare of the two, in your formative assessment, of the two texts which one should be published in the next edition? Yeah, maybe that's a good idea. Ah, so barulah dia perasa seronok nak belajar classical Chinese. Dah lah classical kot. <laughs> you know, uh, and in your summative, tak apa lah you want to use whatever ways that you would normally want to use in the final exam. I, you cannot run away from that. But even then, if they're so used to it and you, you, have, you are so creative, your questions in the final exam were probably different than the 20 years that you have been here in the university. Do you understand what I mean? Hmm. Question, question. Yes, yes. Raise hand. Uh, ask, please. Uh, Prof, just to ask, uh, tadi saya ada tanya tentang effective, right? Yeah. So, can we uh, incorporate that effective element dalam this particular apa nama ni, course? Because uh, maybe you want to create an appreciation that to that classical Chinese language, right? Can. Appreciation. Boleh tak kita masukkan elemen effective dalam ni? Boleh ya? Eh? Jom macam ni. Boleh. Yeah. Tetapi adakah kursus ini telah pun diletakkan efektif dengan kognitif uh, pada cost learning outcome dia? Kalau tidak, tak boleh assess lah. Tapi boleh guide. Memanglah masa you buat tu, dia pun akan rasa macam seronok, appreciate kan. Uh, there is a sense of appreciate, uh, uh, you know, being appreciating the language. But then you can't uh, assess them because it's not part of your CLO. Unless it says here, katalah yang ni kita dah letak. Sekejap, eh? I'm trying to see whether. Sekejap-sekejap-sekejap. Uh, Kalau mengapresiasi bahasa Cina klasik boleh tak? Mengapresiasi. Hmm, itulah kita hmm, okay, apresiasi nak. I'll try to use the word in English. But normally that one will come at the other COOs like the higher level of the ah. the level, uh, yeah. Okay, you sebenarnya, this level is what? What level is this? If you say this is lower level, C2. Low? 
C2. C2. C2 C2 is compare bandingkan peraturan dalam uh, peraturan-peraturan dalam bahasa Cina klasik. Membuat perbandingan. Mm. Okay, But for the moment we cannot change the CR, right? <laughs> yeah, yang tu lah. This is what I say departmental ni. You have to go to, go yeah. to the department. And just yeah. now, uh, what was suggested in terms of effective, if you use the word, if you had used the word banding, mm. it's actually compare in bahasa Inggeris, the the level yang connected to it, com, uh, level connected to compare ialah C2, C4, C5, A4. Mm. You know, A4 means organizing values. A4 means Organizing values into priorities by contrasting different values, resolving conflicts between them, creating a unique value system. So it's when they appreciate, they compare, they realize that, oh, ada baiknya bahasa klasik ni kalau dibandingkan dengan bahasa modern. Contoh, yang ada dalam situasi yang ni, bahasa bahasa ni lebih lebih membawa makna uh, terjahan minda compared to the bahasa normal, uh, bahasa, I don't know what you call it, bahasa conventional i'm just saying it's cutting je kan i'm so sorry if i <laughs> if i misunderstand all this but do you do you get what i'm trying to say here yeah, then yeah 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 yes that's why all of you have got to be clear your course only aku kena clear then only your brain can somehow you know already that's a c4 level that's a a4 level or c2 level a4 level you know already your formative assessment you're going to target to c2 level a4 level your rubric will be related to that And because okay. this is knowledge, ah, senang lah. Knowledge means it's just content. So you are going to look at the content. How how much, how how are they able to grasp the the content of understanding classical Chinese texts, mm -hmm. the rudiments of it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, anybody else I'm, I'm now like I dah tak tahu Siapa punya yang I dah tengok Siapa punya I dah tengok Kalau ada Ingat dah Kau random macam ni Ni dah tengok ke dah Oh Dim dah bawa Okay sorry See I told you Okay Yang ni apa Shakespeare and his contemporaries Okay Uh, course, learning outcome Interpret Renaissance texts in relation to their social context Oh, because you did not put it there I got to start thinking what is interpret Hang on a minute, bear with me Okay, which level is this? Because it can be C2, C3, C5 Lower level or higher level? Kok uh, Sume, are you here? Okay, so you can go as low as C2 or high as high as C5 where you have to evaluate. So if you evaluate, that meaning you will have to dif different texts lah, where you will um, be evaluating different, different texts and, you know, different kinds of renaissance theater uh, and all that so and the learning outcome is um communication skills so it's communication skills will be uh, well communication skills will be communication skills so lagi like, dah senang all you need to do is just do what if it's interpret because interpret is all um it can also be a5 a5 is internalizing values you only the highest in 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 effective So you you have a value system that controls their behavior. The behavior is pervasive, consistent, predictable, and most importantly, characteristics of the learner. Instructional objectives are concerned with the students' general patterns of adjustment. Uh, they can do group work. Uh, they are able to approach uh, the right manner when problem solving, display professional commitment to ethical practices in daily basis and revise their judgment on changes of behavior in light of the new evidence. So memang elok sangat-sangat lah uh, untuk A5 for for this particular for this for this for this particular course learning outcome. Unfortunately, I really don't know what exactly is the level of the um, the course learning outcome for me to 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 you 
you know to to discuss further but um there are lots of opportunities that you can do uh any anyone else here that i have missed uh, and you would like me to 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 share and give some feedback before i move on because i know that i've got half an hour left have i looked at this i have Faisal, do you need any questions? Do you want to ask any questions about this? No? Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I've done this. Have I done this? No, I have not. Okay. Um, this is about intro to IR. IR, I guess, is uh, Industrial Revolution, girl? No, International Relations. <laughs> okay, international relation. All right, so introduction to oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to read. Yeah, in, uh, international relation and the development of international relation as an academic uh, discipline and international relation theories. Okay, so the CLO is identify the basic concepts in international relation. It's just C two, and the learning outcome is communication. So you want to have a group presentation on a case study, which means you're, you're, you're going to provide a case study for them to do the presentation. Anything else that they can actually do with this? International relation. What else can they do apart from group presentation on a case study? Anybody else wants to give any feedback? If you were teaching this course on international relation, international relation uh, in what context in the real world? In the real world, what would be what would be the scenario? Like world politics. Yeah, maybe they are attending a UNESCO convention somewhere. And they have to now um, figure out how, well, what, what is it under introduction to international, right? the development of international relations? Dr. Sheila, you know, human trafficking. <laughs> ah, discuss about human trafficking, correct. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all these things, that makes it more interesting. Uh, so they can actually do role play, where they do the role play and everybody can actually listen to them. Um, having a go at their discussion or if you really really are creative enough you can actually organize a social gathering the class is no longer in the in the hall you go and say well one cafe book it for your whole class order sandwiches for 120 students um, and you ask them to mingle around and get them to talk about uh, international uh, relation before they do the group presentation. They have got a conference after that. They've got to to tell what they have what they have learned from the representative from other countries and what they're going to do for their respective countries. So they maybe then they're not they're not members of Malaysian delegates. They might be from other countries' delegates, and they are trying to um, solve you know certain issues. So they are identifying all those concepts, identifying all those, those uh, concepts that will be relevant to the level of the course and yet make it interesting because then they know how important it is for them to understand all these concepts when they actually, if ever, will be a, what do they call that? Apa? Yang people yang go overseas. Uh, ambassadors. Ambassadors. Diplomats. That's right. If they are ambassadors of Malaysia. So at least they've already got all the various countries. So they will be a very well-informed ambassador because not only they know about their country, they also, because of this course, know what are the, 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 the actual recent uh, issues um, uh, in their other countries. And that's part of international relation anyway, right? It's not about you knowing just about what your context is. You need to also know about what other people and be aware of other people's culture and, and, and so on and so forth. Looks good. 
Okay, I'm going to stop. I think that's the end for that. And I shall move on. Alma, my slides now are gone. It's forcing me to... Where is my slides gone? Well, actually, that's it. Uh, because all of you were supposed to go and do your uh, discussion. Yeah, that's it. I've got nothing to, to share anymore. So let's go back to that. Pretty much I'm done. Prof, I think you're on mute, Prof. Thank you very much for telling me that. Um, any any questions from the audience or any anyone who has actually submitted their work and I did not have a go at looking at it? Can you please let me know? So, so many have not submitted and just want to listen. Um, questions then? Questions? All good? All good means you understand what's going on? Silence means uh, two things. Either you're... Uh, yes, please. Please ask. Uh, sorry, bro. Just a, a simple question. Yeah. Uh, untuk when we come up with our course learning outcome, mm. Okay, mm. how many? Uh, what would be the best number of CLO that mm. need to be included in a course? And then in terms of, of mixture, mixture, mixture of the, those uh, three sub component. For example, like if we're talk, talking about effective psychomotor and also uh, cognitive, right? Mm -hmm. So should we like have one from any? Uh, you know, each of those. You know, for example, one from psychomoto, one from effective, and one from your cognitive. So, so what would be? I don't know whether there's any hard and fast rule on on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, um, actually, there's there's no straight straight cut answer to that. Basically, uh, MQA has already stipulated that you you should in every course have a, a, a between three to five CLOs. Okay. To me, five is too much. Four to me is already a maximum. Um, so if you have four, that's that's good enough. Um, five, I think, is just too much because you'll be doing a lot of assessment. Remember, every CLO do you have to assess. Okay. Um, the next question is, um, do we need to have psychomotor, cognitive, effective, and the learning skill? The Remember I told you about when we are, the concept of learning is, you learning is where change is permanent and learning is, learning happens when you are able to stimulate the head the hand and heart so if we concentrate only on certain certain even if you're teaching what is that cooking uh culinary uh, even if you're teaching that it sounds it, it appears as if it's psychomoto you know very psychomoto but if you don't have the heart and you don't have the, the thinking going on when you're preparing the food. That's why the food is terrible. People only come to the restaurant once and they don't want to go, the, they don't want to go anymore because even the cook don't, don't taste their food. So 
if you 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 cook with passion, that means there's effective, and you are thinking because you know what kind of what kind of the ingredients that should go together with the food, then you will definitely create you know wonderful menu. So in my view, because learning is defined as stimulating the head, the hand, and heart, by right, every course, every course, huh, satu kursus, you, you if you have four course learning outcome you can be you can you can you can have each one on cognitive one on effective one on psychomoto one on soft skill that's up to you or you can have a mix of psychomoto and cognitive effective and cognitive learning uh, soft skills and effect something like that uh, soft skills and 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 um, uh, effective so you can have a, a blend um, not more not many but you know at least two uh, to each but all the course learning outcomes for that one particular course would have allowed you to stimulate the head, the hand, and the heart of your students. That is my view. Uh, there are many school of thoughts. So some people still feel that cognitive is like, you know, I mean, if I were to ask all the instructors now, you, the whole entire world, I think, if ever they want to design, they would definitely go towards what? They'll be skewed towards what? What do you think? Cognitive. Cognitive is the easiest. <laughs> and that's the reason why we create people who know that that's wrong and still do it. Because we fail to inculcate those values until they've got strong principles that they know it is wrong and they've got very strong principle not to do it and in their action, they don't do it. Now we've got a mismatch because everybody is concentrating on the cognitive. They know what is right and what is wrong. But when they do it, that's another story altogether. Is, does that answer your question? Hmm. Any more questions? So... The whole notion of designing appropriate assessment, always, 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 you go back to your what? What do we look at? CLO, first learning outcome, yes. Yeah, yeah. Never, 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 never leave them. Once you understand the cost learning outcome, and it's not just looking at the words, you have to know the level. You have to be clear of the level. Are we talking about... because? As, I, as we showed just now, if you use the word explain, it can be C2, it can be C4, it can be C5. So which level are we talking about here? Lower? Higher? If it's lower, uh, then the, the delivery has got to be for the lower and the, the way in which you assess must be at that lower base. So that's, that's, it's, that's what it means by in all fairness. You're, you're being fair to your students. Why? Because your students are not just taking your course. In an undergraduate course, they will be taking many courses. It so happened that in the academic structure, your course is designed in such a manner that it comes first, and that's why it's at the lower level, C2, C3, you know. And um, if you want to tackle the higher level, you, that will be the prerequisite to the next courses that they will be taking, which will cater to the higher level of C4, C5, C6, until they come to proposing or a solution or suggesting something. All right. Okay, Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Can I ask questions, Prof? Yes, I'm waiting Jaya. for questions. Okay. Um, all right, I'm teaching IMC, Integrated Marketing Communication. Okay. So I have dilemma yeah, uh, from changing uh, alternative assessment to final exam. Mm -hmm. Because all the while, when I do alternative uh, uh, assessment, all score, mostly uh, A minus and A. Mm -hmm. So I read my um, CLO. Okay. Um, Would you uh, like is to it, share your CLO? Okay. Can you share? Uh, hold on. I, I don't provide using your template, okay. but with my own borang lah. Okay. Um, okay, just, just I, I read for you. Uh, membina, build a 
build an IMC, Integrated Marketing Communication Plan based on principles and practices in IMC. So that means the students are required to uh, build the, the, the planning, how they can develop the communication. Uh, for example, advertisement or any campaign. Advertisement, advertisement campaign. So, based on this Selena outcome, the taxonomy is P3. P3. So, they, they, of course, they can do by following all the principles exactly step by step. So, in this case, um, mostly can score this. Is that okay, Prof? If, if I want to change to exam, of course, they need to memorize, right? So I just, what I'm do you out think? of curiosity, out of curiosity, why do you want to change it to final exam? <laughs> because um, because we're just to happy see. they got some more on the is that it? I, I'm worried, I'm worried, Flo, because they they uh, the management will say, hey, senang sangat ke this course semua dapat A. So um, uh, that's my dilemma. What, what do you think? And also the CLO number four, also the same thing. Uh, measure the effectiveness IMC campaign using the specific uh, method or technique. So, so they can choose any, any that, that one one at a time. Can I uh, can I talk about the bill dulu? The uh, bill, bill. Kalau you na, uh, the problem is sekarang ni in your in your syllabus you have already identified that um, for this particular CLO it will only cater to P three. Am I right? Ah uh, yes. Ah, because this particular word bill can be C three, P three, P four, P five, P seven. Okay. So they're very sakomoto based. Bila yeah. they're sakomoto based, would it be it? Uh, would it be easy? Um, would it be appropriate for final exam, or would it be appropriate for alternative assessment? Logically, alternative assessment, lah, because they need to. Perform Kan ha. So Apa masalahnya okay. Satu <laughs> The other thing is ha. Not only that you are focusing on P3 By default Because you you have not even considered the C3 It's now You have already identified That this particular CLO Will be just P3 Not you lah Your faculty hmm. Hmm. Have already uh, identified That this is already P3 So P3 can 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 You can do that in the alternative assessment Dah lah tak cukup lagi dalam banyak-banyak P tu P3, P4, P5, P7 Ambil P3 pula tu yang lowest Oh, This one for undergrad bro? Ah, yelah, I'm not saying that's wrong hmm. I'm not saying that's wrong I'm saying that um, Kenapa yang isu yang Kalau they have already You've already understood what is P3 You dah tahu dah P3 tu sebenarnya uh, deeper early stages in learning a complex skill that includes imitation, trial and error, adequacy of performance is achieved by practicing, performs uh, following instruction to build a model. You know, if they, so you probably have a checklist lah kalau mereka nak buat build, uh, uh, to do the model masa formative kan? Yes. Mula-mula pasang apa, 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 apa. I don't know mm. how, I, I'm not from that area so I wouldn't know. Um. I, I'm sorry if I, I sound gibberish. Um, so you probably can have a checklist and you can see whether they have actually ticked all the the, the requirement, the requirement. Mm. behavior. And if they follow the standard, mm. students will be able to bill and they can bill. Why you must have that norm reference again? Uh, that's what I'm saying. Outcomes based education, to in my view, because it's related to students, it's very criterion reference. You have got a standard. If you Correct. want it to be difficult, then put lah C3, P7, difficult lah. But you already told me that this is a uh, undergraduate, I'm assuming it's year one, year two students, year one good. Year three. Oh, year three. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, year three students. Um, tapi tak nak ambil C3. So, uh, it's year, year three students, uh, dah, dah year three. So, maybe... Maybe P3 is not the, the right Not appropriate right hmm, Maybe But that one is already dalam curriculum So we ha, cannot ha. simply change kan Betul, betul, betul Tapi yang inilah Bila kita dah faham sebagai tenaga pengajar Kita dah faham dekat mana struktur Kursus kita dalam the whole entire program We never we never consider tau Kita selalu We only look at our own course saja kan Mm-hmm. Um, apa ni Couldn't be bothered where it is in the in the program So we huh. Orang kata P3 Okay P3 
uh, when we do the curriculum review, uh, habis tinggi tukar the references or tukar one word, two words. But we mm. never look at the overall picture of where this course is, um, uh, whether the, the difficulty level is suitable to the year of the students, what are the prerequisite knowledge that they can actually do. So, mungkin because of that, dah lah year three, suruh mereka buat at P3 level, of course that everybody can score. So it's not a matter of changing the alternative assessment to summative assessment because it is it it doesn't as you said logically it is not logic to change it to now um, asking questions because it's not even C three it's not even cognitive it's psychomotor. Hmm. You, you see my you see my hmm. my point. So importantly, the way how we put the uh, measure uh, the the level of measurement, right? Ya, yeah. so sekarang so, ni semua orang kena ikut silibus sahaja. Jadi kalau kalau kita betul-betul dah buat formative assessment and kita dah buat summative assessment, even if you put at P7 pun, if the students follow the criteria, follow and abide and build and manage to achieve the 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 criteria and the learning outcome, who are we to deny them from getting their A? Hmm. So all you need to do when people ask you why is it that so many of them dapat A? Show them the formative assessment that you have done in the classroom. Show them that you have actually provided them a lot of feedback that they are able to know um, how to improve themselves and they are able to get it. Isn't that what uh, institutions of higher learning should be looking at? The ability of all their students to be able to grasp and have mastery in the knowledge? So it shows that indicator the progress is uh, good enough. Maybe from A scratch they don't know anything. So from formative itself, and then uh, finally they are able to achieve what we want actually. Yeah. So yeah, successful for that course lah. Mm. Mm. So do you have to have your own standard in your rubric too? The rubric setting too must be clear lah. Must be at the P three level. Uh, apa ni, so that you know uh, that you have fairly evaluated them you know when when they've got their score it's it's fair it's a fair it's fair evaluation uh you said the, but basically rubric two is general prof they the tada lab based on p3 p4 so let's say are able because we are standard macam one to five like a scale yang bawah macam tu je lah the ha, tak boleh lah Suatu yang I'm saying, I'm saying sekarang ni, semua orang kena, bila dia nak buat rubrik, rubrik dia tak boleh ambil daripada, uh, daripada, daripada tempat luar. Rubrik dia kena cater kepada dia punya cost learning outcome. Sebab cost learning outcome dia dah specify the level and the standard. Because right now in UM ni, kita ada macam uh, school bagi standard. So, kalau kita nak design our own based on learning outcome, then how we need to validate pula? Ah, ah that's yang the problem. Take so Kalau so you long. have a standard, uh, ah. assumably, I, I'm presuming, I'm assuming lah. Ah. Kalau dia ada standard, as long as you can, then kenapa pula dia pun nak, nak pertikai kan? Kalau dia dah standard and kononnya dah validate, yang boleh guna untuk semua orang yang ambil daripada P1 sampai P7 pun boleh guna. Uh, kenapa hmm. dia nak, dia nak, uh, apa ni, pertikai kan? Tapi kalau I lah auditor, I akan pertikai lah macam mana you buat satu standardized uh, uh, rubric for all different levels because the P1 to P7 the attributes are different the sub attributes are different okay uh, can you share based on your experience uh, kalau dah banyak level tu what kind of rubric differences macam mana you tahu you know measure kena faham that's why you have to understand the P, apa beza P3 dengan P4 dengan P5 dengan P7 sebab kalau guna perkataan bill tadi tu hmm. empat empat tu boleh boleh guna Katalah yours Katalah uh, Assuming uh, You are you you are going to choose P7 hmm. Dalam rubrik tu boleh ada P3, P4, P5, P7 tu Boleh You can start from lower to the higher Tapi the highest will be P7 Tapi kalau dia P3 You tak boleh go beyond P4, P5, P6, P7 That is not fair to the student Because the course level is just at P3 Do you see what I mean? Hmm. So if you're using a standardized, uh, that's my question lah. How is your standardized <laughs> able to adjust 
to the the, the different sub attributes that you have um, in the psychomotor itself. Jangan cerita lah yang kognitif lah. Hmm. Sama juga lah dengan efektif. Okay, I think um, need to have another workshop ni, Prof. Ah, <laughs> Just to so, measurement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, focus yeah. measurement. Yeah. Mm. Uh, InsyaAllah. But I hope um, by doing this particular workshop has given you some ideas about yeah. what is it that you are looking at when you're preparing your assessment. Um, and and be creative when you are coming up with the formative assess- uh, the activities that you have in the you know in throughout the 14 weeks to uh, help your students to to feel like oh it's worthwhile learning this it's not just another writing another review you, you know you you make it in such a manner that they can see them doing this in the real world setting uh, that it, then i think students will become engaged and and you will learn a lot from your students if you start doing it. Believe me, I've, that's that's what I always do. Um, okay, with... thank you, Prof. You answered my questions. No problem. Omu, I know you dah dua tiga kali dah nak keluar connecting audio, connecting audio. I uh, I um, I know you you're giving me the signal that there's five minutes left. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I truly truly uh, thank you. <laughs> For being a, such a sport, um, I know it's not easy to be uh, in a workshop, especially if it's online. And I apologize for all the struggles and the glitches that I have on my part. Um, I find using technology uh, challenging but interesting at the same time. And sometimes after being able to do it, and I feel oh, not too bad for my age. Um, so I do um, feel happy uh, to be here um, with you this whole half day. Uh, and I do hope um, whatever that uh, we have um, discussed will be helpful to you in preparing appropriate assessment uh, for your own course. Uh, thank you. Assalamualaikum.